and Transocean Drilling Rig President Stephen Newman testified on Capitol Hill about efforts to stop the flow of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. West Virginia Congressman Nick Rahal is the chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee. We ready? You ready, Doc? Committee on Natural Resources will come to order, please. We are now uh, some 20 hours into Operation Top Kill, anxiously awaiting the results, hopefully today, later today. In the meantime, we will continue our uh, hearings, our oversight hearings on the Outer Continental Shell Oil and Gas Strategy and the implications of the Deepwater Horizon rig explosion. Pursuant to Committee Rule 4G, opening remarks will be limited to the Chairman and the Ranking Member during today's hearing. In my view, the Obama administration has been and is doing everything humanly and technically possible to contain and stem the well, which is still the first priority of all of us, of course. The President is in charge, not BP, and his administration, primarily through the Coast Guard Command at Tad Allen, is directing the emergency response. While it is frustrating and heartbreaking to watch the continued hemorrhaging of oil into the Gulf, I think it is important to state, counter to what some people have alleged, that it is in no one's interest, certainly not the Obama administration and not BP, to allow this oil to continue gushing into the Gulf of Mexico. I take Secretary Salazar's at his word when he testified yesterday that he would be relentless in assuring that the well is capped and that the environment will be cleaned up after this horrible incident. Since he has taken over at Interior, Secretary Salazar has imposed new ethics requirements, abolished the scandal-ridden royalty and kind program, and generally set a new tone that we believe is affecting the performance and management at the Department of Interior. But while commendable, that is not enough. We will continue our oversight responsibility, we have been rigorous from the beginning, and we will continue to be rigorous in our oversight responsibilities and trying to help those, many others, to find the answers of what happened here. So with that, I recognize the ranking member, Doc Casey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like, to, I'd like to start by offering my condolences to those who lost uh, family, friends, and co-workers in this terrible accident. The loss of 11 hardworking men cannot be forgotten in this tragedy and serves as a stark reminder of why you must work to ensure like something like this never happens again. Yesterday we heard from Secretary Salazar and other administration officials as this committee seeks to find answers to the decisions and actions that led to the explosion and the sinking of the Deepwater Horizon and the ongoing oil spill. Today, we will hear from the companies directly responsible for this rig and well. We all hope to learn more about what is being done to stop the leak and the cleanup of the spill. Yesterday, as I stated, both BP and the Obama administration have a joint and shared responsibility to do everything they can to stop the flow of oil. I want to make it abundantly clear that there is not just bipartisan agreement but a bipartisan demand and commitment that the responsible parties pay the full cost of the cleanup and all the damages caused by this spill. I'd like to briefly discuss <clears throat> something that may will happen later on, and that's the President's press conference scheduled for later this afternoon. This morning's news reports are full of stories quoting a top administration source on the announcement that the President will make at his press conference. The President is announcing that offshore leases and drilling scheduled for months and years from now are being delayed. Administration officials say that the President's eyes have been open and that is why he is acting. There may be some real merit in taking a pause in some of these areas, 
But the fact still remains, oil has been spilling now for over a month in the Gulf. There are un untold number of gallons of oil that are floating in the Gulf. The governor of Louisiana, Governor Bobby Jindal, reports that oil is washing ashore on 100 miles of his beaches in his state. And federal law explicitly states that the president is responsible for overseeing the cleanup of oil spills in federal waters. So rather, focusing, rather than focusing on things not scheduled to happen for months and years from now, the president, I believe, needs to get focused on the actual crisis at hand. The public expects the president and this administration to carry out their duty under the law and get focused on stopping the spill and cleaning it up. The economic toll of this bill is still climbing, but it's important that the actions of the federal government don't impose further economic harm by hastily acting without all of the facts. If decisions are being made that could put people out of work, then there must be solid information justifying these actions, and it must be publicly disclosed. Having seen the impact of $4 gasoline in our economy that we experienced two years ago and on their families' pocketbooks, the American people understand the need for more American-made energy. The American people know that American-made energy means jobs in a stronger national economy and stronger national security. The leak must be stopped, the oil cleaned up, and then we can get to the, to the bottom of exactly what happened so that informed, educated, and permanent reforms can be put in place to ensure that the American drilling is the safest in the world and a spill like this won't happen in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. We will now hear from our first panel, Representative John Geramandi, California 10th District, our colleague and member of Congress. Welcome, John. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you very much for this uh, extraordinary privilege of addressing you at this moment when we are in the midst of a crisis on the Gulf Coast. Uh, the purpose of my attendance here and participation in this is to say uh, Murphy was right with his law. What can go wrong will go wrong. We've seen plenty of that in the past uh, in the Gulf over the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years. We've seen some 38 blowouts. Uh, in California, and this brings me to my point, uh, we saw a massive blowout in 1969 in the Santa Barbara Channel that led to a uh, moratorium uh, on the West Coast on the, in the state waters for the last 43 years. As Lieutenant Governor in the state of California last year, I led the fight to stop new oil leasing in California waters uh, in my previous uh, work as the Deputy Secretary of, at the Department of Interior in the 90s, we made a major effort to stop new leases off the West Coast and persuaded, uh, with very little trouble, President Clinton to continue the presidential moratorium on the West Coast. We need a law. And as you ponder and listen to the uh, reports from the oil companies uh, as to what's happening today and what did happen and caused the blowout, I would like you to keep in mind that stuff happens, really bad stuff happens. And we've seen that on the Gulf Coast. It will happen again. Despite every effort, accidents do occur. And when those accidents occur, should it be from a drilling platform on the West Coast and a blowout occurs, we're talking about a major, major problem, environmental to be sure, and economic. In California, it is calculated that the coastal environment of California provides the state with $22 billion annual um, economic activity and employs 369,000 people. In Oregon, it's $17 billion annually, and some 17,000 people are employed. In Washington State, 150,000 people and over $8 billion. We value that economic activity as much as we value the precious coastline, the fishing, and the other opportunities that it presents to us. No more oil. We can drill baby drill, but we can also count on spills baby spill. And that's happened. Not just this one incident, as horrible as it is in the Gulf Coast, but it's happened over and over throughout the world. A huge blowout on the west coast of Australia last year that took months to contain. And here we are once again. It's time for a permanent law. That's why my bill, 
H.R. 5213, the West Coast Ocean Protection Act, deserves your attention and deserves your pondering as you listen to the testimony of the oil industry today. I would ask you to consider the other legislation that has been proposed by our colleagues here in the House, a permanent protection on the East Coast in law, not just depending upon the President, but rather depending upon the laws of this nation, and also an expansion of protections on the West Coast of Florida. These are important. In addition to all of the economic activity, it's time for this nation to end its addiction to oil. As long as we drill, as long as we open our coastlines to drilling, we will continue our addiction, just as surely as a junkie on the street will find the next pusher. It's time for us to say enough and to spend those vast amounts of money that are employed in the drilling industry, to spend that money on the renewable energies of all kinds. Solar, wind, geothermal, nuclear, all of those things must be our future. And it's our opportunity today to push the junkie aside and to end our addiction. And the legislation that I'm proposing and my colleagues are proposing set us on that course. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I look forward to working with this committee. I thank you for the work of the members of the committee and what you have managed to do. And I join you in attentive listening to the next witnesses. Thank you, John, for your testimony. Do any of my colleagues wish to question? John, who is in? Um, I'm sorry, are, you, are we making a law against tankers or are we making a law against drilling? Uh, this is a, my bill would prohibit permanently new drilling leases in the federal waters okay. off the west coast. So there's more spills with tankers than there are with drilling. But we're going to outlaw the drilling, even though there's more spanks, um, excuse me, more, uh, more spills in terms of volume from tankers. What's the rationale? My esteemed colleague, it's the oil that's the problem. As long as we So presuming upon, that we'll still need oil for the, for, you know, the next 30 years, I mean, unless you're going to raise prices at $10 a gallon, we're going to need oil for the next 30 years. Well, the prices are likely to be raised by our friendly people that have the oil in the Gulf states, in Venezuela and Nigeria, and by the oil companies. And of course, they'll be more able to do that if they control the market. So the more dependent we make ourselves on foreign supplies of oil, according to the military, the more vulnerable we are. So I'm thinking I'm hearing from you, we need to shut down what we do locally so that we can import more, from which we know that there's more spills, it increases our dependence, and raises cost. Again, I'm not seeing the rationale. I beg to differ you differ on your economic theory. I will yield. Uh, I would love to see your, stat, your facts in. I will yield. I think the gentleman's statement was that he's seeking to replace that oil and additional oil in those tankers by changing the energy policy in this, uh, in this country. If I may we, all recognize, we all recognize that that takes... That's, if I may reclaim my time, I think it's about 1% that solar now provides... I understand energy. all that. We all know that. And so if we're going to do that, it's not going to be in the near term. It's going to be at least three decades off. So for the next three decades, do we increase our environmental hazard by importing more, make ourselves more vulnerable to foreign co governments, all because there's this emotional response? I think what's incumbent upon us to be very factual here. The fact is, if it's, I very, might, it's sir, a hard economic response for our state. Uh, yes, you might, because you your might fuel costs are among the highest in the nation. So you might look to your own state oh. to check out the emotional and the economic response along your own You coast. do not have to tell me about that. You do not absolutely have to tell me about that. On the other hand, my own state understands completely that the more we import, the more tanker accidents there are in New Jersey, the more tanker accidents there are around the coast, that's statistically. That's not something just rhetorical, that's statistically. That tankers are more likely to spill than is, even with this one, uh, than are oil rigs. I yield to Mike. I yield. Um, thank you. I, just a question. Uh, um, in your legislation, is there anything to, to move forward on the nuclear? Uh, I think you mentioned uh, nuclear power as, as a renewable source. Uh, uh, and, and, and certainly there's been some, there, there are certain groups that oppose that. Uh, what in your legislation would, in fact, uh, incentivize nuclear power in the United States? 
Uh, my legislation speaks specifically to the issue of the new drilling leases off the west coast of, west Ameri of uh, the West American states. It does not speak to nuclear. I'd be delighted to work with you on programs, policies, funding to move the nuclear issues along, including those advanced nuclear systems, normally called stage four, that would over time allow us to consume the present nuclear waste coming from the stage threes. I think we have to move in that direction. Although this is a new policy, 30 years ago I was not there, we now, I now understand that we have to move in that direction. And you speak to renewables such as uh, wind and solar, and those require, those technologies today require natural gas. Uh, uh, when the wind isn't blowing and the, and the sun isn't shining. Uh, it, does your uh, legislation speak to that? Uh, it does not. However, the competes legislation, which was stalled on the floor by a recommit, did speak to it. And uh, certainly I voted for it in the Science and Technology Committee and will vote for it again because it provides the research to fill in the gaps. Uh, certainly we'll see uh, natural gas, which is a better alternative in the medium term for me than the oil industry, or than oil. Uh, but we need to do the research on storage capabilities, both mechanical and battery storage, chemical storage, and uh, nuclear as, as we just discussed. And certainly we need to see an expansion of the other green technologies from biofuels of all kinds, advanced biofuels, uh, solar, wind, geothermal. All of these things have to be in our future. We simply cannot continue to depend only on oil, and that's the fundamental argument that I'm making here. We have to move time. away from it I'd like while protecting our coast. Reclaiming my time. The gentleman's time from Louisiana has expired. The chairman did not mean to open up a hornet's <laughs> nest here among ourselves, <laughs> and we're not going to have a hornet's nest among ourselves. But I will, since I recognize one member on this side, I'll recognize another member on our side, and then only one more on each side, and I believe I saw the other gentleman from Louisiana's hand over here, and I saw the gentleman <laughs> from California's, Ms. Capp's hand over here. Nice. But before that, I will recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Heinrich, and then the two I just mentioned will be recognized, and that will be it. <laughs> gentleman from New Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank our colleague from California for, uh, for being here today. I think we need to have these discussions. You know, judging by the, uh, some of the statements that we heard in this committee yesterday, many of our colleagues have discovered their oversight role in all of this. Uh, but frankly, for the last year sitting on this committee, um, most of what I heard was, could be characterized as boosterism. And I want to read some of, the, uh, some of the statements that we've heard over the last year and a half in this committee uh, from our friend Mr. Cassidy of Louisiana. Indeed, offshore drilling is much safer than, say, the cars we are driving around and dropping oil on the street, which then runs off into the bay. Uh, our friend, Mr. Brown of South Carolina. Despite the heated rhetoric, the OCS program has an outstanding environmental record. It is our nation's safest energy extraction program. And Representative Rohrbacher of California. Decades ago, there were a few well-published accidents that led to oil spills. 1969 was a long time ago. We shouldn't be basing our judgments on what is important for our people or what is good for the environment based on what was done with technology that was put to use in 1969. That was probably technology that was developed long before 1969. The fact is that we can have underwater wells, wellheads that have almost no chance of spilling, even in the middle of a hurricane and even in the middle of the Gulf. I hope that as we move forward, we can balance our boosterism with a little more healthy oversight. Thank you, Mr. Will Chair. Will the gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yield? Um, actually, I, I would yield to Ms. Capps of California. She has her own chance to speak. Yes, I would. Thank you. John, thank you very much for bringing this legislation to us. I have a simple question that, uh, you know, as we were talking about the the uh, tankers and accidents that are there, that there are more that are, that are done there. Isn't it a lot easier to clean up the oil from a tanker and it's, uh, it's not as, cost, uh, as costly to us? And we have the drilling, it costs us a lot more. Isn't that so? I, I really don't know the, the relative costs. It, I suspect it will depend upon the nature of the spill and the amount spilled and where it is spilled. 
Uh, certainly, tankers present a major problem. That's but one of the But it doesn't continue to leak. It doesn't continue what with the problem that we have right now, because right now the leak that we have, we haven't been able to stop it. A tanker, we're able to clean that up because it isn't leaking. It's a tank that basically has spilled, right? Well, and certainly in the case of the Gulf, not 5,000 feet down. Mm -hmm. uh, in all cases, oil is a very serious environmental hazard. Uh, whether it's, and we just heard some quotes here, it is a very serious problem. It demands the utmost uh, safety precautions. And in this hearing, you'll undoubtedly get into that issue. We certainly have seen in the past with the Exxon Valdez what happens when you use a single hull tanker and a captain that isn't exactly on the top of his game. So we need to have those protections at, at every level. But the major point here is that the West Coast of America is a very difficult place to, to drill for oil, certainly north of Cape uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. You've got a completely different environment than you do in the Gulf, with the exception of hurricane season. When that occurs, you've got, it, it, and you have a very rich ecological system, both uh, marine as well as terrestrial, and an economy that's been built upon those extraordinary values. My point here with regard to the legislation is let's protect it. And in doing so, literally force ourselves to move away from our dependence on oil. If we, as long as we can get the drug, we're going to get it. Mm -hmm. So get the junkie off the street. Move away from oil. Don't give ourselves more opportunity to continue doing what we know is risky, harmful in many, many ways. And if I wanted to open up another hornet's nest, I'd mention the climate change issue. But nonetheless, these are real issues out there. And as long as we continue to make it possible to go for the drug, we will. It's time to move away from that. And in doing so, protect an extraordinary economy a fishing economy, a tourist economy. Uh, that's my point here. And my colleagues that are, that are concerned about the East Coast have similar views. I don't know if they're on the committee. If they are, and perhaps they'll add to the hornet's nest. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank uh, my friend for uh, coming before us today to talk about this. Look, we spent a good part of yesterday hearing from Sec Secretary Salazar talking about how this was Bush's fault. Uh, we heard all about how it was BP's fault, and certainly there is fault there, no question about it, but how it wasn't the President's fault or any of the President's administration. And then today, it seems to me that we're hearing pretty much the same uh, idea from Rahm Emanuel, which is let no disaster go to waste where we're politicizing this terrible event. Uh, I'm from Louisiana, as my friend Bill Cassidy is, and there's no state affected in this process more than the two of us in this uh, committee. And so I, I'm, I'm disappointed that we're using this uh, to advance a political agenda, quite frankly. Uh, I, th I thank my friend, uh, but honestly, I would much rather see us focus on the problem at hand I don't think this is a, a form in which we should be advancing cap and trade and all of these other things. Uh, and, and also, I'm a little disappointed. Uh, Mr. Heinrich uh, quoted my friend, uh, Mr. Cassidy, and then wouldn't yield to him to respond. So with that, I'm going to yield to my friend, Mr. Cassidy, and let him respond to those uh, points that were made. It's actually disappointing that what is called boosterism is facts. The National Research Council, and I can bring it to you, Oil in the Sea, international or national kind of conference, said that 60% of what is in the ocean is seepage. It is natural seepage. About 20% is runoff. I may be a little bit fuzzy on my exact details, but about 20% is runoff. About five to ten, uh, less than 5% is related to uh, what is happening with transportation or with the drilling. Turns out, that's not boosterism, that's facts. Uh, unfortunately, facts are sometimes seen as boosterism. As regards natural gas, offshore drilling has given us most of our new finds of natural gas. So as we go to our green fuel, which I absolutely accept as a nice way to transition, most of that green fuel is going to come from offshore or from fracking. Now, fracking has also found its opponents, and so it may be that we're just going to pretend that energy happens. 
Sure, 1% of our energy comes from solar and wind, but it's just going to happen. And we don't have to worry about anything or anything. We're just going to send more overseas and pretend the tankers don't spill like the Exxon Valdez. Would the, Mr. Would the Baca, gentleman yield? You would, not yet. Okay. Mr. Baca, I think that the people in Alaska would say that the Exxon Valdez, with its heavy crude, was indeed quite an accident. And it was not something which um, uh, they would say is any less than what's happening to the Gulf Coast. Lastly, we cannot account for negligence. There may have been negligence in this thing, but negligence is not inherent. Negligence is something which can be prevented. And I think what is responsible here is for, and believe me, no one outside of Louisiana cares more about this issue than someone from Louisiana. If there was negligence, we wish to have that isolated, identified, and prevented in the future. On the other hand, energy does not just happen. Many of the prescriptions you see for a better future will come from offshore drilling. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah, uh, I, I just want to reiter reiterate uh, some of the statements that uh, Dr. Cassidy made again, and that is that we know the majority of oil that's in the ocean is through natural seepage and not through spills. This is a very unfortunate event. Uh, it'd be lovely if we could turn our energy over to solar and to windmills. Uh, someone said the other day in committee meeting here that they felt like that uh, turbines uh, is the up and coming technology while oil and gas is diminishing. Well, I would suggest that we've had windmills for 400 years. So I don't see it that way at all. If you look at windmills and the technology behind them, it's not there, it's not overtaking other forms of energy. Uh, it's less than 1%. I do agree with moving forward on, um, on nuclear energy, but we don't have an infrastructure to build that. We're gonna have to put that back together after all of these years. Uh, so again, I would like to focus on what's going on here today uh, rather than advancing political agendas. And with that, I yield back, Chairman. And I, I'm putting my sti stinger back in my pocket, too, sir. The uh, gentleman yields back. this time and under the chair's prior dictum, I mean announcement, the uh, gentlelady from California be the last one to be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to reference our uh, first witness and, and uh, thank our colleague for talking about the West Coast and, and his legislation and our history. And you referenced uh, the big spill, uh, the, the blowout of Platform A in 1969, during which time I was living in that community of Santa Barbara, which I'm honored to represent today. Uh, I just would call attention to the fact that that platform is drilling today. It's been drilling ever since. And along with 20 other platforms offshore, off my district in, in uh, Central Coast of Southern, Cal Southern California. And so the, the truth is that offshore drilling is occurring and will occur probably for the next three decades. Um, the con comparison with tankers is uh, interesting too because I've introduced legislation. We have a lot of tankers going up and down the, uh, the uh, Santa Barbara Channel and I've introduced legislation to require double hulls. That would take us a long way toward safer uh, tankering, which we will also be doing for a, a good length of time. The topic of this, um, at, uh, this hearing today is Outer Continental Shelf Oil and Gas Strategy. And I just want to thank the President for a statement I believe he's going to make today, which we'll call a moratorium on new leasing. We're talking this legislation that was brought up by uh, Mr. Garamendi is about new leasing. The process of leasing takes years in many places. And we're talking about leases that will expect to drill far beyond the three decades. And I applaud the decision to call a pause or a moratorium on the new leasing of the new kind of technology that existed on the deep water horizon rig, which then exploded. So uh, with that, I can yield to my colleague, uh, Diana DeGette, and I, I, then also to Mr. Inslee. I thank the lady for yielding, and I also want to thank Congressman Garamendi for coming. I want to ask you, um, Congressman Garamendi, if you're aware of this recent MMS study. Uh, the good news is it showed that, um, that in general, um, the way these wells are installed um, has been safe, but the problem is there have still been failures. And I think part of the concern that we have, we had some hearings over in the Energy and Commerce Committee, part of the concern many of us have is while in general these, these deep water wells can be safe, if, there's, if there is a problem and, and our friends on the other side admit there can be problems like obviously happen here, systemic failures. 
The downside of that failure is catastrophic, as we're seeing right now in Louisiana. And so, so I would think you would agree, and I would certainly hope our friends on the other side of the aisle would agree, that, um, that if we are going to install wells, that we have to have appropriate oversight by MMS and other agencies, and we have to have appropriate um, safeguards put in place by the, by the companies doing that because even though failures are rare, the catastrophe to the ecosystems, either in California or on the East Coast in the Gulf, can, can be devastating to those economies. I'm wondering if you could comment very briefly on that, Congressman. I can comment uh, both with um, emotion as well as some uh, history. Having served as the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Interior uh, in the mid-90s, we were very concerned about the Minerals Management Service and took certain steps to try to change the culture of that organization. I, uh, the Chairman pointed out in his opening remarks the efforts that Mr. Salazar, Secretary Salazar has made uh, to straighten out what is an agency that is in desperate need of restructuring. Uh, the restructuring, the division of responsibility is underway. Apparently, it'll be a piece of legislation or at least an appropriation um, issue. Uh, that has to happen. Also, a few heads have to roll. The new uh, director of that agency uh, has a great reputation. Unfortunately, she's only been there for, I think, about four months. Hasn't really had the time to straighten things away. But uh, Minerals Management Service has to be a regulator, not a handmaiden to the industry. And it's incumbent upon us to make sure that that happens. Um, I just want to point out, Mr. Cassidy has suggested that it is possible to prevent oil spills. And the one point I want to make is we're going to have the President of American Operations of British Petroleum up here in a few minutes. And he is going to admit something that is very true, which is that every single oil well in the world today creates an invisible oil spill because it creates carbon dioxide when we burn the oil. That goes into the atmosphere. It goes into the oceans and creates carbonic acid. And the oceans are 30% more acidic than they are today. We have invisible oil spills from every single oil well ever drilled in human history. And we're going to have to figure out a way over time in the next figure, a few decades to wean ourselves into new forms of non-carbon sources of fuel. And Mr. German, I just appreciate your legislation, because it's not inconsistent with the bill we passed, which unfortunately all our colleagues voted against, which will do advanced nuclear, which will do coal sequestered coal, which will do solar and wind. I appreciate your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearings. And <laughs> in our second panel, Composed of Mr. Lamar McKay, Pres uh, Chairman and President, BP America Incorporated, and Mr. Stephen L. Newman, President and CEO, Transocean Lim Limited. Gentlemen, we welcome your familiar faces to Capitol Hill again. And uh, we do have your prepared testimonies. Mr. McKay, you may begin whatever manner you wish. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Rahal, Ranking Member Hastings, members of the committee, my name is Lamar McKay and I am Chairman and President of BP America. We have experienced uh, a tragic series of events. This, this horrendous accident, which killed 11 workers and injured 17 others, has profoundly touched all of us. There's been tremendous shock that such an event, such, a, such an accident could have happened. And there's been great sorrow for the lives lost and the inju injuries sustained. I've seen the response firsthand on the Gulf Coast, and I've talked with the men and women on the front line. There is, there is a deep and steadfast resolve to do all we humanly can to stop this leak, contain the spill, and to minimize the damage. We will meet our obligations under the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 to mitigate the environmental and economic impacts of this incident. Our response efforts are part of a unified command. 
It provides a structure for our work with the Departments of Homeland Security, the Departments of Interior, and other federal agencies, as well as state and local governments. We are committed to working with President Obama, members of his cabinet, the governors, congressional members, state agencies, and local communities across Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, and Texas. I want to underscore that the global resources of BP are engaged and have not been spared. Before I, descri before I describe our response efforts, I want to reiterate our commitment to finding out what happened. The question we all want answered is what caused this tragic accident? A full answer to this and other questions will have to await the outcome of multiple investigations which are underway. These include a joint investigation by the Departments of Homeland Security and Interior, which is the Marine Board. It includes the President's National Commission, it includes congressional investigations, and an internal investigation that BP itself is conducting. This week, representatives from the BP investigation team briefed the Department of Interior and other U.S. government officials on, on their initial perspectives based on the data and the witnesses available to them so far, as well as areas of focus for further inquiry. There is a lot more work to do, including more interviews and analysis, as well as full forensic examinations of the blowout preventer, the wellhead, and the rig itself, all of which are currently on the seabed. But the investigation team's work so far shows that this is a complex accident involving the failure of a number of processes systems and equipment. Put simply, there seems, to be an un there seems to have been an unprecedented combination of failures. Now let me turn to our response efforts. In the subsea, our subsea efforts to stop the flow of oil and secure the well are advancing on several fronts. Our primary focus has been on what is known as a top kill, which we began yesterday afternoon. There, this is a proven technique for capping wells, though it's never been done in 5,000 feet of water. This technique injects heavy drilling fluids into the blowout preventer and the well bore in an attempt to kill the well, which would, be, which would then be capped with cement. We do not know how long it will take for the operation to prove successful or otherwise. BP will continue to report on the progress. If necessary, we are also preparing a junk shot, which is a technique to clog the BOP and stop the flow. It involves injecting fibrous material into the blowout preventer, followed by drilling mud to kill the well. Now, in parallel with the top kill, we've got the development of a lower marine riser package cap, or a containment option. This is designed to capture most of the oil and gas flowing from the well and transport it to the surface. We're also drilling two relief wells to intercept and seal the original well. This will take an estimated three months. Now on the open water, a fleet of more than 1,200 response vessels has been mobilized under unified command. With the Coast Guard's approval, we continue to attack the spill area both on the, sur on the surface and subsea with biodegradable dispersants from EPA's approved list. To protect the shoreline, we are implementing what the Coast Guard has called the most massive shoreline protection effort ever mounted. Almost 3 million feet of boom are now deployed with another 1.3 million feet ava available and 1.1 million feet on order. 18 staging areas across the Gulf Coast are now in place and thousands of volunteers have come forward. To ensure the rapid implementation of state contingency plans, we've made available $25 million each in block grants to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. On Monday, we said we would make available up to $500 million to fund an open research program studying the impact of the Deepwater Horizon incident and its associated response on the Gulf of Mexico. Now beyond the environmental impacts, there are also economic impacts. BP will pay all necessary cleanup costs and is committed to paying all legitimate claims for other loss and damages caused by the spill. We are expediting interim payments to individuals and small business owners whose livelihood has been directly impacted. 
To date, we've paid out over 13,500 claims, mostly in the form of lost income payments, and those have totaled over $37 million. We have an online claims filing system. Our call centers are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we have 24 walk-in claims offices and over 400 adjusters working on this. Our intent is to be efficient, fair, and responsive. We are taking guidance from the established regulations and other information provided by the U.S. Coast Guard, which handles and resolves these types of claims. We are also making available $70 million to Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi to help promote tourism. Tragic as this accident was, we must not lose sight of why BP and other energy companies are operating in the offshore, including the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf provides one in four barrels of oil produced in the United States, a resource our nation requires. BP and the entire energy industry are under no illusions about the challenge we face. We know that we will be judged by our response to this crisis. No resource available to this company will be spared. I can assure you that we and the entire industry will learn from this terrible event. We will emerge from it stronger, smarter, and safer. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Mr. Newman. Chairman Rahal, Ranking Member Hastings, and other members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Stephen Newman. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Transocean Limited. Transocean is a leading offshore drilling contractor with more than 18,000 employees worldwide. I am a petroleum engineer by training, and I have spent years working with and on drilling rigs. I have worked at Transocean for 16 years, and I am incredibly proud of the contributions our company has made to the energy industry during this time. Today, however, I sit before you with a heavy heart. The last five weeks have been a time of great sadness and reflection for our company and for me personally. Nothing is more important to me and to Transocean than the safety of our crew members, and our hearts ache for the 11 crew members, including nine Transocean employees who died in the Deepwater Horizon explosion. These were exceptional men, and they, they performed exemplary service for our company, and we are committed to doing everything we can to help their families cope with this tragedy. Over the last few weeks, we have, we have also seen great acts of courage and kindness in our colleagues and in our communities. That courage and kindness was embodied by the 115 crew members who made it off the Deepwater Horizon that night and were as concerned about the safety of their colleagues as they were about themselves. It was embodied by the brave men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard who provided on-scene response and search and rescue efforts. And it was embodied by the medical professionals and the friends and families who met the crew members when they arrived ashore. And it is embodied by our friends and colleagues at Transocean and across the industry who have rallied to help the families of the men who were lost. This has been a very emotional period for all of us at Transocean, but it has also been a period of intense activity and effort. Immediately after the explosion, Transocean began working with BP and the Unified Command in the effort to stop the flow of hydrocarbons from the well. Our finest engineers and operational people have been working with BP to identify and pursue alternatives for stopping the flow as soon as possible. Two of our drilling rigs, the Development Driller 2 and the Development Driller 3, are involved in drilling relief wells at the site. And our drill ship, the Discoverer Enterprise, is on scene conducting crude oil recovery operations. We will continue to support BP and the Unified Command in all of these efforts. At the same time, we have been working hard to get to the bottom of the question to which the members of this committee and the American public want and deserve an answer. What happened on the night of April 20th, and how do we assure the American public that it will not happen again? Transocean has assembled an independent investigative team to determine the cause of the tragic events, a team that includes dedicated Transocean and industry experts. They will be interviewing people who have potentially helpful information and studying the operations and the equipment involved. Because the drilling process is a collaborative process involving a number of companies, contractors, and subcontractors, 
the process of understanding what led to the April 20th events and how to prevent such an accident in the future must also be collaborative. Our team is working side by side with others, including BP and governmental agencies, and these investigative efforts will continue until we have satisfactory answers. While it is still too early to know exactly what happened on April 20th, we do have some clues about the cause of the disaster. The most significant clue is that the events occurred after the well construction process was essentially complete. Drilling had been finished on April 17th, and the well had been sealed with casing and cement. For that reason, the one thing we do know is that on the evening of April 20th, there was a catastrophic failure of the cement, the casing, or both. Without a failure of those elements, the explosion could not have occurred. It is also clear that the drill crew had very little time to react. The, in, the initial indications of trouble and the subsequent explosions were almost simultaneous. What caused that sudden violent failure? And why weren't the blowout preventers able to squeeze, crush, or shear the pipe? Those are critical questions that must be answered in the coming weeks and months. Until we know exactly what happened on April 20th, we cannot determine how best to prevent such tragedies in the future. But regardless of what the investigations uncover, ours is an industry that must put safety first. We must do so for the sake of our employees, for the sake of their families, and for the sake of people all over the world who use, rely, and depend on the oceans and waterways for their livelihood and sustenance. I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. As uh, we've already heard this morning and has been reported in the media, uh, the President is going to be having a press conference here in an hour or so with some uh, announcements to make. This being Washington, D.C., and the city that it is, we're already uh, aware of what he's going to report, according to the experts. Uh, it's reported that he's going to uh, extend the moratorium on deep water drilling for an additional six months and cancel the upcoming Western Gulf lease sale and the Virginia lease sale. Would you uh, both share your opinions if this is what he announces? Would you uh, have a take on this announcement? Mr. McKay, you first. I don't have a take directly on the announcement. What I would say, I think it is important that we learn from this incident everything we can learn as quickly as possible that will influence, I think, uh, practices, industry practices that go ahead, as well as the regulatory environment by which those practices occur. Mr. Chairman, I think a, a pause is prudent. I think it's, um, it's incredibly important to understand what happened and how to prevent such an incident in the future. Uh, but I firmly believe in the long-term importance of the OCS to the economy of the United States. If you think about offshore drilling as, a, as an exercise in risk management, the, uh, the regime in the United States, Transocean works in 30 countries around the world, and the regime in the United States, the approach to risk management in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico is at the upper end of the spectrum. And so the, the, the the ability we have in the U.S. To, to manage risk is far superior than other places in the world, and I would hate to see us export that challenge of risk management to other areas of the world. You said a pause would be prudent. Are you referring to shallow water drilling, deep water drilling, or both? And for how long would a, uh, is a pause? I'm referring specifically to, to deep water drilling because this is the, the – uh, this is the incident that, that we're specifically discussing today with respect to the Deepwater Horizon. Um, w w as I said in my opening comments, we're, we're working very hard to understand what happened. Um, I, I don't know how to give you a definitive timeline around okay. what sort of a prudent pause would be. Uh, let me ask you both. Uh, yesterday at the Coast Guard MMS investigative hearing in New Orleans, the chief mechanic on the horizon uh, testified that there was an argument between two, uh, between top Transocean and BP employees on the rig less than 12 hours before the explosion. Rather heated argument, as it's, it's been reported. The chief mechanic, Douglas Brown, said that Transocean's top manager strongly objected 
strongly objected to BP's plans. One of the Transocean employees who also objected, the primary driller, Dewey Rivet, would perish in the explosion that night. Can either of you shed any additional light on exactly what this argument was about? I cannot. I've not. I've not seen anything other than what was in the press on that particular uh, discussion or argument. Mr. Chairman, I don't know what the particular discussion related to, whether it was a, a task to be carried out later that day or what it related to. Well, I, I hope we can find uh, a little more information on exactly uh, what this argument is about, because I think it could give us some very valuable clues as to what what really happened here, and that's all of our primary goal, is to find out what happened so it won't happen again. Uh, Mr. McKay, in the timeline that your investigators put together, there are these very anomalous pressure readings, sometimes between 6.40 p.m. and 7.55 p.m., about two or three hours before the explosion. This slide says there was a discussion about pressure on the drill pipe and that the rig team was satisfied that the test was successful, despite the fact that the pressures were off. Do you know who was involved in that discussion and how they might have convinced themselves that this was a successful test? Uh, would the company man have been involved? I don't, I don't know for a fact, but I presume probably so. Most of those type of decisions are collaborative on a rig. I do think that, as we've noted in our in our investigation that there were anomalous pressures that were measured. Uh, there were decisions made to move forward uh, through steps of the procedure, and we believe that there was a, you know, a, a significant period of time that the well was giving signals that there, was, there were issues occurring, uh, and we need to piece that together through all of the investigations. And I think all discussions, all data, all processes, and all decisions that were made are going to be extremely important. Through the, through the investigations. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Hastings. <clears throat> thank you very much, to Mr. Chairman, and thank uh, both of you for, uh, for being here today. Uh, both of you stated uh, something that I agree, and that is that we need to get to the bottom of this so we can make an informed decisions as to what happened and whatever corrections should be made uh, in the future, because I I, too, am one that believes that there is a potential in the OCS and we need to continue doing that, but we ought to obviously have to do it in a very safe way. Uh, just a kind of a, of a perspective, it's my understanding that since 1969 there have been some, something in excess of 36,000 wells drilled in the OCS, and I'm talking about the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic and the Pacific and, and in Alaska. And since 1969, this is the first incident that we've had. Now, I only say that to, to put things into perspective because we know there is risk in everything we do. For goodness sakes, I fly back and forth to my home in Washington State every weekend. And there's risk every time I, I get on an airplane. So I just think that once we get to the point where we have uh, all of the facts, then we can make some informed decisions. And I suspect that there will be some revelations that are maybe embarrassing to the private sector, and there will probably be some revelations that will be embarrassing to the public sector. Well, that's fine. We, we need to deal with that and try to make sure it doesn't happen in the future. But what I want to, what I would like to ask you, both of you, I, the area I represent uh, has the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, which is the most contaminated nuclear, uh, you know, site in the, in the world. There's 53 million gallons of radioactive material that is in the process of being glassified uh, and sent hopefully to a national repository. But the reason I only bring that up, because when you're dealing with these type of materials, there's a lot of risk. And on the ground, the contractors there uh, have a policy. All of the contractors have a policy. If there's anything unsafe, a single uh, individual can stop the process. And I, I've never been out on a on a rig in, on the Gulf, but I would suspect that something like that would happen, and I would ask you if you could both tell me what your safety uh, rules and regulations as it pertains uh, uh, to uh, those rigs on the site. Mr. McHale, I'll start with you. Well, our, our words are very clear that any, any employee, 
anywhere at any level, if they have any concern about safety, have the ability, in fact, the responsibility to raise their hand and, and try to get the operation stopped, whether that's our operations or a contractor's operations. And I, I would presume all, everybody on that rig probably had the same ability to, to do something and stop operations if they felt it was unsafe. Okay, Mr. Newman. Congressman, what you're uh, talking about, we refer to as stop work authority, and it is a fundamental component of our safety management system. And we have a, uh, we have a regular program for recognizing individuals who have taken that stop work authority. Uh, we call it I made a difference. We, t we take a picture of the individual doing this, calling a timeout for safety. And uh, we send that across our entire organization because we want our people to know that they have that opportunity and, in fact, obligation to stop any unsafe act or condition from causing an incident. So those conditions existed on the rig, and of course we won't know what happened until we get all of the facts and figures, but the point is, is your policy in both of your cases is a policy by which somebody can stop whatever operations are going on if they think it's unsafe. Is that a, f a fair way to say that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to follow up briefly in, in your uh, remarks, Mr. McKay. You said that you block granted funds uh, on the cleanup to the various states. Uh, and there's been some talk now in the news, uh, and I alluded to that in my opening statement, where Governor uh, Bobby Jindal of Louisiana is somewhat frustrated where he has at least a plan. Now, my only question, I guess, is those funds that you block granted to the state could be used uh, as, far as, stopping, uh, as far as stopping the uh, oil coming on shore. Is that the intent of that? Yes, the, in, the intent of those block grants were to allow the local, what are called area contingency plans at the local level, for instance, in a parish level, to be actioned as quickly as possible such that there's no waiting time on funds. Uh, so that's what those funds are for, yes. Okay. Well, I, I, uh, I, I wanted to make that point because we, we, we seem to have a little bit of, of tension between a governor on the ground with trying to make sure his state is protected by this spill uh, and is a, a degree of difficulty at least in getting these funds put in place so he can do what he is supposed to do uh, uh, as a governor of the state. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired and I yield back. John from California, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, I appreciate your testimony and your remarks. What we're doing is we're managing a failure and uh, every time we have a catastrophic event like this in, involving uh, British Petroleum or other parts of the oil and gas industry we're told uh, that this is an unpredictable cascade of unforeseeable errors uh, that this is unprecedented that nobody could have foreseen this this is sort of like the bankers on Wall Street nobody could have foreseen the risk that they engineered themselves and so nobody's responsible uh, I don't believe that this is some kind of black swan or perfect storm event. Uh, there wasn't something that nobody could foresee, uh, and uh, I don't think you can promise it will never happen again. Yesterday we spent a lot of time talking about changing the culture of MMS, the Minerals Management Service, and how that culture was uh, wrong. Uh, I wear two hats. I'm a member of this committee and I'm chair of the Education and Labor Committee. I spent a lot of time with British Petroleum about safety, about killed workers, about injured workers, about processes that they go through. This is a record that the American people ought to understand who's doing business on our outer continental shelf. Back in 2005, BP had a tragic Texas City oil refinery killing 15 workers, injuring 180. During, during the restart of gasoline production unit, the tower was overfilled, caused flammable liquid, liquid geyser to erupt from the stack. Critical alarms and control instruments failed to alert uh, operators. BP had, had no flare to burn off the hydrocarbons, eight previous releases from the, state, from the same stack. BP relied on, on, on low personnel injury rates as a safety indicator. Following Texas City, BP commissioned a special report by S former Secretary James Baker, in which he found that BT BP tolerated serious deviations from safety operating practices and included material deficiencies in process, process safety performance existed BP's five U.S. refineries. In 2006, British Petroleum spilled 200,000 gallons of crude oil over Alaska's North Slope. In August 2006, BP found oil leaking from flow lines that were severely corroded 
with losses of 70 to 81 percent in 3 8 inch thick pipe. British Petroleum had not done internal pipe clean out or inspections for 14 years to save money. In November 2007, British Petroleum pled guilty to a single criminal misdemeanor in violation of the Clean Water Act and paid $20 million in fines. This falls $22 million in fines paid in 2000. In 2009, OSHA fined British Petroleum an additional $87 million for the 700 violations at the Texas City oil refinery that killed 15 workers, injured 180, after they failed, after four years, to fix the deficiencies that they promised in the settlement. And now we're still wondering what happened on, on, deep, on, on the uh, deep water horizon. I think what we see here is we see, we see a pattern of a, that apparently BP is impossible if it's for you to keep oil in the pipelines, whether it's on the north slope of Alaska, the outer continental shelf, or in your own refineries. And that if we have a failure of processes here that have been noted numerous times. It's not just me who's noting this. But a report uh, on the oil leakage, you commissioned Booz Allen, and they, and they found out that you had deeply ingrained cost management ethics that led to the, to the failures to inspect. You would then asked the chemicals, or the Chemical Safety Board did a study on, on, Texas, on Texas City. Cost cutting and budget pressures from the BP group, executive managers impaired process safety performance at Texas City, and 15 people died. You then asked former Secretary James Baker to, to, make a, to make a determination. BP does not effectively measure or monitor safety performance. Budget cuts of 25% were imposed upon Texas City. Your own internal people came to, came to your executives, went into the boardroom in London, and said that these changes should be made. Most of them were not, and then you proceeded to cut the budgets by 25%, and the refinery went up in smoke and those people died. The fact of the matter is that there are red flags on the safety record, on the cost-cutting activities of BP throughout the years, and I think it's time for the American people, for the Congress of the United States, to ask just who is doing business on the outer continental shelf. This is not a right, it's a privilege. And when these companies are struggling to replace inventory, the outer continental shelf is a prize and we ought to guard it jealously, and we ought to be clear about what kind of companies and what kind of record they bring to that bidding process. They should not be able to exclude companies just by bidding more than others, and I think what we see here, this is a culture. I've, I've discussed this culture with former chairman of the board of BP, I've discussed it with their glass executives, I've discussed it with the refinery executives, and the culture continues to persist. I appreciate you got awards from MMS, but maybe this was the clash of two really bad cultures. Thank you. Well, the gentleman from California's time has expired, but the chair will give the panel a chance to respond, if you wish. I would briefly respond that we, we have acknowledged that in, in uh, Texas City, Alaska, uh, that there were some fundamental mistakes made. We have... Um, worked very hard. We've got a new CEO, 2007, who's uh, effectively single agenda item for quite a bit of his time with safety, safe, compliant, and reliable operations. We have instituted changes from the top at the board with, a, with the uh, uh, safety and environmental ethics audit committee. We've added a group or uh, operational risk committee at the top. We've set up an entirely new division effectively, which is safety and operational integrity. We're instituting operation management systems around the world at every operating business to, to conform and be standard. Um, this in incident, we don't know what happened yet. I do expect it will be uh, a combination of factors that include human error, processes and equipment. Um, all I can tell you is we are dedicated to make this company the safest in the industry. and. Uh, we, we have not gotten there yet. We've made a lot of progress, and we continue, continue to work on that. So the direction has been clear, and I acknowledge what you've said from the past, and we've taken responsibility for that. Well, I still, we'll talk more, but I'd, I'd like to get the facts around the, uh, uh, the gather, gathering center number one fire in Alaska, where we still apparently cannot get a candid report on what took place there. 
The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Fleming, is recognized for five minutes. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, gentlemen, for uh, coming today. Um, I come from the healthcare industry. I'm a physician. Uh, industries such as healthcare, airlines, uh, the work that you do are risky industries. One of the things that we've discovered is that in order to be safe, you have to have redundancy in multiple systems, safeguards, fail safe systems. The good news about that is that if something goes wrong, you've got backup systems. The bad news about that is that oftentimes people can cut corners and get away with it until finally all of the factors align uh, and that once in 30 years or once in a, even a century situation occurs where everything goes wrong and then you have a disaster. Uh, I know that you are not fully knowledgeable or, or have been briefed about what went wrong, but let me mention some of the things that were that have come out about this thus far. Uh, it seems that the problem began with an accidental destruction of the rubber annular, um, I guess it's called an annular. Uh, and there was evidence that this had occurred, but it was ignored. And then there was uh, discovered a failure of uh, the redundant electronic system. Apparently, that's fully redundant. And throughout this process, one had not been working well at all. So that really meant you had one reliable system at best. And that uh, because of time pressures, that instead of using the normal uh, heavy fluid for drilling, that it was... Um, substituted with either light fluid or salt water. Uh, and as the story goes, that's what the argument was about, was the fact that lighter fluid than normal was being used. Now, again, I can't confirm this, but this has been reported, and I'm sure we'll find out over time. But it seems to me that this reflects that there was a culture that had developed, and I don't know which company, or maybe it was both, I know that uh, it's come out of the news that one company seemed to be concerned about the procedures of the other one, and I won't say which one was which, but it seems to me that the culture had developed sort of a, a time pressure and a relaxation of some of the safety and backstop. So I, I open this up to a response from both of you, gentlemen. Congressman, you've, you've raised two questions that, uh, that I can respond to, one with respect to the annular. And, and just so the committee understands what we're talking about, this is an, a, a piece of rubber that's about three feet in diameter. It's about 18 inches tall, and it weighs about 2,000 pounds. And in the 60 Minutes report that aired, which, uh, which can, included an interview of one of Transocean's employees on the rig, he made reference to having seen a small handful of chunks of annular material come across the shakers. So this is small handfuls of material of a 2,000 pound piece of rubber. And if you consult the manufacturer's own specification sheet, that specification sheet will tell you that this element is subject to wear and tear. And so, you know, having small chunks of rubber come off this is not unusual and, and not an indication that the annular element was destroyed. And in fact, the annular element was repeatedly tested subsequent to those events and passed every one of those tests. Yeah, uh on that point, though, if the annular is not working properly, uh, you could get misreadings on pressure. Is that correct? You could get misreadings on pressure, but those would be readily identifiable as misreadings on pressure, and they would be characterized as failures of the test. Is it possible that someone could misinterpret that reading? Uh, the, the reading is relatively straightforward. You either get a straight line, and that's an indication of a successful test, or you get a sloping line, and, and that's an indication of a failed test. Well, it was reported that the pressures were uh, acting very unusually, and that, uh, again, um, uh, apparently there was some discussion or uh, inability to really interpret what those pressure uh, situations were and why they were occurring. If you're referring to confusion on the day of the 20th, I'm not sure that the annular element was even involved in, in those uh, pressure readings that were taken on the 20th. So th th it's entirely possible that they may be completely unrelated issues. Uh, the other issue, the other question you raised was with respect to the control system, the, the dual redundant control systems that are responsible for operating the BOP. And uh, th repeatedly throughout the well, 
uh, those systems are tested. Uh, the industry refers to those dual redundant systems as blue and yellow. And the uh, tests alternate between those blue and yellow sides uh, according to regulations. And, and every time they were tested, they passed those tests. Mr. McKay? I do think, I mean, you asked some questions that I think the investigations are going to need to come to grips with, which is what, what type of decisions were made on what type of information at the time. And there were anomalous pressures that were taken at various times. And, you know, the detail of the different conversations and what was said and who was objecting to what, I don't know. But the investigations will need to get to the bottom of that, I think. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And First and foremost, I think that uh, from all of us, our heart and our prayers are with the families of those that lost their lives on the 20th. This is serious. And especially as our nation's been horrified by the plumes of oil that devastated marine life, local seafood industries, vulnerable wetlands, and the waters of the Gulf of Mexico, we watched the company most responsible for the spill, British Petroleum, understate the spill's extent and impact while trying to escape blame for the Earth's greatest environmental catastrophe since Chernobyl. Although the sheer volume of oil has stunned most Americans, I'm finding it extremely hard to believe that BP executives share our, sh our shock. Over the past decade, BP has grown to become the largest company in America, syst systematically undercutting its competitors on safety issues. In 2005, BP's Texas refinery exploded, killing 15 workers, injuring 150 more. And we've heard this time and time again. Shortly after the plant had cut maintenance by spending less than, or cutting their, their expenditures and safety by 41%. The next year, a poorly maintained pipeline rupture spill, 200,000 gallons of crude over the North Slope of Alaska. BP has claimed time and again that it's learned from its mistakes. However, it continues to cut back on employing environmental safety costs to increase its profits. Over the past three years, 97% of all the flagrant violations in the refining industry found by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration were located at just two BP refineries, one of which was the very refinery in Texas City that exploded in 05. BP citations were classified by OSHA as egregiously willful, meaning that they reflect violations of a rule designed to pre prevent cat catastrophic events at refineries. According to Risk Metrics, a consulting firm that scores companies' commitment to health, environment, and safety, BP is among the worst performing major oil companies in these areas. Last month, we witnessed another explosion connected to BP at Deepwater Horizon that killed 11 more people and spread a devastating slick across the Gulf. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised to hear that the Associated Press has reported that a Transocean employee on the rig prior to the disaster stated that he had overheard, and I quote, overheard upper management talking, saying that BP was taking shortcuts by displacing the well with salt water instead of mud without sealing the well with cement plugs. That's why it blew, unquote. Once again, BP abandoned its workers for the sake of a little more profit. Mr. McKay, the record-breaking fines that have been levied against BP over recent years, all finding that 97% of egregious willful violations over the last three years, one of which was the Texas City refinery that exploded in 05, undermines your company's claims of shock and devastation and a willingness to correct these problems. BP's record appears to indicate that the company has determined that an occasional fatal accident is no more than a cost of doing business. How can any company possibly correct problems with its corporate culture that are so deeply interwoven into your business model that even the loss of life has not forced to change? And at what point will jeopardizing the health and safety of your workers and the environment no longer make sense to your bottom line? There have been massive changes made to the company. I, I went through a few earlier. Just, just to, to mention, in terms of safety and operational integri integrity spending, that is, uh, that's been rising. It's been, uh, uh, you know, we've spent over a billion dollars uh, in Alaska. We've spent over a billion dollars in Texas City rebuilding. More importantly than that is, is the agenda that has been created by our new CEO after those events. That is clear top to bottom. That's our agenda. That is our priority. I, 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 I cannot say the causes of this incident. But what I can tell you, we've got 23,000 employees in, the, in this country working to be the safest company in this industry. And, and, and we have made massive changes. As I said, progress is being made. It will never be finished. But I believe this company is making, um, has made major, major steps at its core since those incidents. 
And Mr. McKay, let me read a couple quotes that came back from 2007 by the former CEO. BP gets it, I get it too. I recognize the need for improvement. After the 11 member panel that BP asked to study its US refineries at the urging of the US Chemical Safety Board made 10 recommendations, what they found as far as looking even at Texas was, the panel said BP had not learned from a long string of past accidents, had a false sense of confidence about safety, did not always ensure that adequate resources were effectively allocated to support or sustain a high level of safety in the industrial process and rotated refinery chiefs too quickly. Again, a lot of what we're hearing now is what's well, been repeated after 2005. And I know we all want to get to the bottom of this. We all want to make sure this does not happen again. But we have to make sure that we are making the investments and that people are, are held accountable to making sure that they're putting the lives of people first and the safety of others before them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll back my time. Time expired. The uh, gentleman from uh, uh, Colorado, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Newman, uh, it has been reported that uh, Transocean has filed a limitation of liability petition. Can you explain this claim uh, to the committee and explain if this applies to claims under the Oil Pollution Act, OPA? Uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity to clarify this, Congressman. We were instructed by our insurance underwriters uh, very early after the incident to file the limitation of liability. So the first reason we filed it was at, at the instruction of our insurance underwriter. So we did that to preserve our insurance scheme. And the second reason is that uh, we're, we're being sued in multiple states, in state court, federal court, uh, across many jurisdictions. And so the limitation of liability filing serves to consolidate all of those into a single venue to ensure that the pace of discovery and the, the process of, of uh, administering those claims doesn't disadvantage one claimant against another. Uh, so we did it at the request of our insurance underwriters and to consolidate all the actions into a single venue. Uh, it, is, it is unrelated to claims filed under the Oil Pollution Act. It is only intended to address non-environmental claims. Thank you. Um Mr. McKay, um, we've been provided a, a briefing uh, by BP on events leading up to the incident on board the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, by your company's own admission, uh, there appears to be a series of problems throughout the day with well control. Can you explain for us what happens, uh, what, what appears to have happened that day and why uh, when there were problems with the well? more caution was, wasn't applied to the situation. I can, I can give the committee um, a, a quick overview of what at least I've been reviewed with the, with the uh, investigation team, which is similar to the review the committee uh, staffers have had. Uh, there were anomalous pressures measured. Uh, there were evidently hydrocarbons that entered the well bore. Uh, uh, the recognition of those hydrocarbons is that question, were they recognized, were they not? It would appear not for a period of time at least. Uh, operations were continued. The well gave signs at various places in time, and I don't have the timeline in front of me, uh, that there was pressure increasing, it would be bled off, uh, and then uh, there would be flow, it would be bled off. And there were various, it was, it's very complicated because there are lots of, lots of uh, operations going on, but there were various indications that uh, hydrocarbons could have entered the well bore and the well was becoming capable of flowing. I think that's one of the, uh, the interim uh, concerns that we've uncovered. Then the operational uh, activities, whether that was monitoring, discussing decisions, and physical operations have to be pieced together. I don't understand those yet, and nor does the investigation team. But I do believe it, it, it became a progressive event, is, is what it would appear and that there were signals that mounted and there was an accumulative effect. And uh, whatever operations were needed to control the well in a well control situation don't look to have happened. And then after things got out of control, a piece of equipment that is designed to operate in that system didn't work. And we don't know the reasons for any of that yet, but the investigations, I think, I have confidence that the investigations will figure that out. And uh, I think with that confidence, then we can minimize and make changes that will minimize the chance of this happening again uh, and, and, and provide confidence for the industry again. 
Well, thank you uh, both for your testimony. I, I certainly concur with you on an earlier statement that both of you made in terms of supporting the, the pause in terms of uh, more leases until we get to the bottom as to uh, what happened and what it will take to correct it. Um, but I also recognize the importance of, of offshore drilling and that that pause that the President is going to be talking about today uh, not be extended beyond that time for which we understand how to correct this issue and how to move forward. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, who's next? Oh. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Washington, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, I have to say, while we've been engaged in this investigation, it's been very disturbing because it doesn't look like BP or the operators went through one stop sign. It looks like they went through five or six at least. I mean, anyone can make a mistake, but it's, it's amazing to me the numbers here. We have a dead battery in the blowout preventer. We have a hydraulic leak in the blowout preventer because someone didn't, didn't ratchet it down. We have a casing decision that, according to various people, a, a decision to use a particular casing for economic reasons at least created a riskier situation. We have a failure to respond to the signals from the well that you were getting abnormal pressures. We had an early decision that may have been involved in the, in the, in the, the argument we heard about, about not using mud. And now, I, we, we, our investigators have just tumbled to another one I want to ask you about that might be number six in this series of failures, and that is about these centralizers. Uh, your staff has told investigators for the committee staff that a decision was made by BP to reduce, in effect, the number of centralizers. Centralizers are sort of a spring-like device that go around to keep the pipe, the, the casing, centered in the, in the well bore. It's very important to keep it centered so you have structural integrity, so you don't get a leak. And originally, uh, BP staff wanted to use 20 centralizers, which would have assured that you had centralizers above the hydrocarbon zone, 500 feet above the hydrocarbon zone. But someone apparently delivered the wrong ones to the rig, according to your staff. And so it was decided to reduce the number of centralizers to only six. And because of that decision to only use six, there were apparently no centralizers in the 500 feet zone above the hydrocarbon zone. Even though there was cement there, there were no centralizers. So that because there were no centralizers there, you may have been off center, which could have weakened essentially compromise the integrity of the system. So could you tell us about why BP made that decision to, to reduce the number of centralizers, why you decided to run this risk of not having centralizers in the zone? And these were conscious decisions. These were before the blowout. Why you decided to reduce that and run that additional risk? I don't know why. That's part of the investigation that needs to continue. I do, I do acknowledge what you're saying. I was in the review I had prior to this with the investigation team. Evidently, six centralizers were run rather than 20 or so. Uh, I, I don't know the reason for that being uh, six versus 20. We've obviously the investigation team is looking into that, not just our team as well. Is this somewhat disturbing, at least, that apparently your staff thought originally there should be 20? You should have them above the hydrocarbon zone. Somebody made a decision to reduce it to six. Is that, is that disturbing? I think, I, think it, I think it needs to be looked at. I don't know the reason that those were dropped. I don't know. I have no idea what the reason they were dropped. So I don't know if there's a good reason or a bad reason. I don't know. And when do you think BP will have that answer? Uh, I, th I think the investigation team will continue to look at it and, and soon. I don't know the, the exact time. We hope that will be the case. And I just have to tell you that it's disturbing to me every single time there's said to be a junction between doing something safer and maybe a little more expensive and something to do riskier and maybe a little less expensive. In this particular case, BP went with the cheaper and riskier solution. To me, this seems like more of a cultural problem than just one running of a stop sign. I just have to relay that as one member of Congress's reaction. I want to ask about a, a larger part of the BP plan for our energy future of, of this country. Your logo, I really like. It's beautiful. It's green. It suggests benign photosynthesis. It was adopted when your previous leadership of British Petroleum wanted to call BP beyond petroleum. 
And the reason is, is your previous leadership recognized that every single oil well in the world is an invisible oil spill because the carbon that we use goes in the atmosphere, it gets burned up, the carbon dioxide goes in the ocean, creates carbonic acid in the ocean. And your previous leadership that understood that that's unsustainable because within the next century, we probably won't have healthy coral reefs anywhere in the world. We will have acidic conditions that could damage 40% of the food chain, the very basic food chain of the oceans. He understood we had to get beyond petroleum. And yet it seems that that corporate goal has now been abandoned by BP and you've reduced your investment in some of the things that can get us beyond petroleum. In fact, has that happened? And, and how do you explain that disappointing event? I would disagree. We've not, we've not abandoned that. We've been very, very clear that we believe in all of the above, including the range from exploration and production to biofuel, solar, and wind. We're still investing on the schedule that uh, Lord Brown talked about years ago. In fact, we're ahead of that schedule. And we are investing uh, primarily in the U.S. on wind and biofuels and solar. So we are still firmly, firmly in belief of that it needs to be everything, and we're still investing in that way. What percentage of your expenses or investments of your total budget go to renewable energy sources as a rough percentage? Just very rough. I, I would say 5 to 10 percent, but I'm not sure. We, we appreciate your comments. We hope there's more fiscal muscle behind those desires. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, just as a housekeeping announcement here, because it may affect future questioning from our members to uh, the panel. Uh, the committee has learned, and it appears to be in the public arena now, that the departure of Elizabeth Berenbaum as director of MMS is imminent. And the chair would say that her departure does not address the root problem. She's only been the public face of MMS for about 10 months, and the most serious allegations that we've learned recently occurred prior to her tenure. This might on the surface be a good start, but this particular individual feels it must not be the end game. And, uh, our efforts to get at the root causes of the problems at MMS. So the chair just makes that as a way of a public announcement. Someone from uh, California, Mr. McClintock, is recognized. In the uh, Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969, that um, uh, in many ways was technically a more difficult situation, as I understand it. Uh, the casing didn't extend deep enough down. There was a fracture in the um, uh, uh, substrata. Uh, fissures opened up. You had multiple leaks, and yet that was contained in a relatively short period of time compared with this disaster. What is taking so long? What is, is, it, is it strictly the, the difficulties of dealing with 5,000 feet of water? There's several reasons. I put them in two, two big categories. One, one is 5,000 feet of water where we just can't get human access and it's, we're working with submarines and robots. Second big category is that we've got a, um, a blowout preventer with a lower, what's called a lower marine riser package still stuck on top and a kinked riser 4,300 feet long. So the ability to, to and, and we've not been able to actuate that blowout preventer through the, the uh, remote operated vehicles as it should be, nor have we been able to get on top of that blowout preventer. Uh, to be able to get some another blowout preventer, for example, on top of it. So this is an extremely difficult, extremely difficult situation. Uh, and we've had to do diagnostic work, uh, non-intrusive diagnostic work through gamma rays, sonar, and radiography to try to understand the internal workings of that blowout preventer such that we don't effectively take a step backwards versus a step forward as we do operations because we've been concerned that if that top of that riser package was compromised, then we may have a much bigger problem. So, so we've had to work without being able to touch anything, see anything other than robots, and build everything uh, on the seafloor with robots. I, I realize you have to drill where the oil is, but directional drilling gives a considerable amount of latitude on where to place these rigs. Why are you drilling in 5,000 feet of water? Uh, directional drilling, it can, can go directionally about eight miles is about the furthest it can go. This is 41 miles offshore, 
from the delta. So it's uh, quite a quite a ways offshore. So directional drilling just can't get you there to to much of the deep well all of the deep water province in the Gulf of Mexico. So so the placement then of the well is determined geologically. It's not yes. regulatory. Yes, okay. exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you would think that uh, through enlightened self-interest, uh, any money that you might save by a lack of due diligence, you would lose uh, many times over by disasters such as this. Um, you certainly have offended the American people all over the country. I'm from Michigan, way up north, but we were offended by that. You certainly should have offended your stockholders for uh, lack, I think, of due diligence. Um, have you recapitulated the construction of this rig and platform to see what changes may have taken place in the construction of this one uh, compared to those that built, were built before that might have contributed to what happened? Or do you plan to recapitulate uh, in detail the construction of this particular platform? I, d I do believe it's really important to understand the the equipment that was operating, whether that's the rig itself or the blowout preventer. Uh, any modifications that were made along the life of that, for example, blowout preventer, and anything that may or may have not worked properly with that blowout preventer, I think that will do several things. One, it will inform as to what blowout preventers sh should do in the future. Number two, I think it will enhance the testing procedures around blowout preventers now. Uh, and number three, I think it, it, it at least begs a question, should blowout preventers be recertified now? And, and I also think what we're finding uh, is that the subsea intervention capability for the industry will need to be looked at in terms of how can you handle these things? Uh, how can you, in effect, have a plan that understands the subsea capability available across the industry and be able to be put into service. So I think there is a reassemblage of the events and the equipment that will be necessary to understand how to go forward. I think it would be very important. There's an old saying, uh, for lack of a nail, the shoe was lost. For lack of a shoe, the horse was lost. For loss of a horse, the battle was lost. For loss of the battle, the war was lost. I think you have to go back and look at every step to see what you may have done differently that may have made this less uh, reliable than uh, previous platforms. You were really going very, very deep, and you think you would take even special precautions, but maybe uh, a decision was made that upon reflection, if you really recapitulate here, you would find out was uh, not the proper decision, maybe not out of malice, but out of not knowing what that may have done to the system that you have put together. And I think that's very important because we cannot tolerate this happening again. Anyway, I'm 81 years old, and in my lifetime I've seen a lot of natural disasters, but I, I can't recall anything that's captured the American people's attention as much as this. And you have not only a fiscal obligation, but you have a moral obligation to do better when you begin to operate in that fashion, going out into the Gulf of Mexico, a beautiful area, and polluting an area uh, down there. So I think you have that moral and fiscal obligation, and I certainly hope that you take both those seriously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dan Mr. Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Um, Thanks. Let's change the picture a little bit. But frankly, there's a lot of folks who hear you say that you're going to pay for everything, but they think you're going to find a legal dodge at the end that will keep you from being on the hook. I'm not going to ask you to comment on that. This is just the preparation for my next question. Eleven people died. I met with some of them. They say that uh, they are covered under the Jones Act and the Death on the High Seas Act, and that uh, they basically, the survivors, uh, are paid lost wages, presuming that they pres and this presumes that the person will stay in the same job for the rest of his life. It will be subtracted from that, that which he would have spent upon himself, say to buy a hamburger, uh, but for do that for 50 years. And then also the, it will be subtracted the income tax he would have paid. 
and that's what's net outpaid. There's nothing for loss of consortium, there's nothing for pain and suffering, et cetera. A woman in my district, a widow, who delivered her second baby after her husband died. Now, um, and apparently the liability for this not only is limited, but it's transferred to one of your subcontractors. Now it's almost a test case, because I think, I want to believe that you really want to make people whole. And when folks say, no, they'll find a legal dodge, I'm thinking, well, let's see. But this actually seems something where, and I was encouraged by your testimony, where you're, you're very conscious of those 11 people. And the question is, will their recompense, if you will, their being those two children, will it be limited to that which is available under the Death on the High Seas Act and the Jones Act, which I gather is less generous than that which covered the, the um, uh, refinery workers in the Texas refinery disaster that they somehow were covered under a different act and there was actually additional recompense made for those families. So first, let me just start with the human element and see what your thoughts are and see if we can get a commitment that you'll meet with those families and consider making uh, some other consideration aside from that which is strictly limited by the law. I, I, be I believe the, the, the families are being, uh, of, the, of the tragedy are being dealt with directly with the, the contractor or their, their employers. For instance, I don't know if this is Transocean or... No, this is a subcontractor who's being involved. And, okay. And they're going to follow the letter of it, if you will. And, and apparently, um, once they take care of it, that's done. And, and they will, I'm sure, limit themselves to what they're required to pay. But frankly, if you will, that's not the moral issue. We will certainly talk to the families. And can I get your commitment that you will do more than talk, that you'll actually make a, a strong consideration of making recompense well, over? We will make a strong consideration, yes. I appreciate that. Secondly, uh, going through the drilling uh, information that BP put together, very helpful. Thank you very much for providing that to the committees. Um, if I start on page 24, I went over this, and Mr. Newman, you mentioned that there was really no sign that something could happen until the thing blew. But I went over this, and from 1705, 5 p.m. in the afternoon to 525 in the afternoon, it looks like they were offloading mud. The mud, logger, the mud loggers were not informed that offloading had ceased. Now, I'm told that that limits the ability of the mud logger to give a safety signal. My gosh, we're getting either some sort of more out or less out that, that, that it's very significant um, that the mud loggers were not informed that offloading had ceased. I guess I'm asking, uh, and by the way, I've also been told by people in academia that you run a safe ship. And they said that's the irony of this. So is there a normal operating procedure that the mud loggers would uh, not be informed, or was this a variation from normal operating procedure? Um, my sense of normal operating procedure would be um, a relatively robust level of communication between all of the subcontractors that are involved in the operation such that everybody's informed about what's going on. So, okay, um, okay, because, because the, the, in the Wall Street Journal they're focusing on the fact there's a disagreement between the two heads, but there may have been a breakdown further down, if you, if you will. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just postulating, I don't know. Also, you mentioned that it wasn't until then, but I'm looking at 1752, and there was influx from the well as suspected at this point because 15 barrels were taken at this bleed. And so, again, it seems like three hours beforehand, there was clear evidence that there was an attempt by the well to begin to flow. Any comments on that? Because well, you mentioned how anybody has the ability to say stop, and yet apparently there was indications for three hours before the, the blow up that the, that it's clear that the well is something flowing in it at 1840, for example. Uh, any thoughts on that? I've not seen that data specifically, Congressman, um, so I, I can't comment on whether or not 15 barrels was the amount of fluid that, w that, the, that they were expecting to, to flow back. I don't know whether that was abnormal or not. I don't know what, what uh, particular operation they were undertaking that, that resulted in that flow back. That's a fair statement. Mr. McKay, any comments on that? I think, I think that 15 barrels, I think five would be calculated as the expected volume, if I remember right. Yes. So there, was, there were some anomalies starting to show up. Uh, and so you would agree that even three hours beforehand there was evidence for... I, I do think there's a significant period of time where there were signals and, there was a, and there's a cumulative effect of those signals that were not recognized. And then on page 33, last question because I'm expired and thank you for your generosity, Mr. Chairman. Page 33, it says the sheen test passed 
and approval was granted to discharge overboard. Who, one, I assume it's seawater you're discharging overboard. I don't know that. It doesn't say. But who gave that approval? Who, who gives approval for discharge to occur overboard? I can show you the PowerPoint if that's... Are you familiar with this? I'm, I'm familiar, but I don't know who gives the approval. Is that a federal agency or is that somebody in Houston at the command? Well, the, it's under, that would be under MMS and EPA regulation, I believe, but I don't know who gives the approval on the rig to actually say discharge. I don't know. Okay, so I guess my question is, is that, and I don't know, I'm just asking all these things. Is that a rig-centric approval, or do you have to get on the phone to someone in Robert and say, listen, can we do a discharge overboard? I don't know, but I believe it's on the rig, I believe. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman's time is expired. Excuse me. Gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I first want to comment. I think there was a reaction to my colleague uh, talking about boosterism. And... Uh, and it was, I don't think it was well received, but the fact of the matter is that uh, we're talking about, uh, this is not about a political agenda by the Obama administration. Um, this situation that we're at right here with our witnesses before us uh, has been uh, getting to this point for a while. Uh, it's been the, the attitude for the last five, four or five years and even uh, that you, we drill first and we're gonna ask questions later and that we have to pull full trust in the companies and in the industry that they'll do the right thing and that we are going to overlook uh, the corruption and, uh, and the collusion going on within an agency that is responsible for the oversight, the enforcement, and the investigation of this industry. And so it's been building up as, 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 as late as uh, March 19th, uh, Almost every member on the other side of the aisle that's on this committee, most if not all, and the Republican leadership sent a letter to Salazar saying, please do not delay opening up new areas to drilling and job creation because it would be a no-cost stimulus for our economy. Again, drill first and we'll find out the consequences later. Well, we're dealing with the consequences. Somebody said we, get to, we have to get to the bottom of this. I think we have gotten to the bottom of this. And uh, the responsibility for what is going on in the Gulf, the responsibility for the aftermath of what is going on uh, rests fully with the industry and the responsibility, and I'm glad that some motion is going on with MMS, rests to some extent, to an extent with this government for having uh, a lax oversight and for encouraging a culture that is responsive to the industry and not too responsive to the public that they would serve. I have one question only. Uh, to both gentlemen. I've introduced legislation that says there is no caps on liability to a company on an oil spill or anything else. Mr. Menendez has introduced the same legislation. No liability caps. Your reaction to that legislation? I don't, I don't have any specific comments on that particular legislation. What I would say, we've been clear in this, in this incident, we are taking our responsibilities as a responsible party very seriously. We have said we are not going to, um, to uh, use any caps of any sort. We've said we're going to reimburse the government for the expenses. We're going to pay all legitimate claims, and we're, not, and we're not going to ask for reimbursement from the government for any claims. So we've been clear that in our, in our situation that we're in, that we're stepping up and saying we're going to deal with this, and we're going to make it right for the people of the Gulf Coast. And, and, and I, I appreciate that. I think the, the legislation talks to now and in the future, not an indiv in, uh, a particular incident. Uh, I think what's going to come from these hearings, and it'll be uh, an interesting experience for each of us here, is uh, a reintroduction of the role of this government in the oversight, enforcement, and investigation of, uh, of uh, oil production and energy production in this country. We have let that go by the side. We're paying for it now, and we're paying dearly uh, for, the, for the people of Louisiana, and I share my colleagues from Louisiana's uh, pain that they're going through. And, and I just want to remind our then colleague, Mr. Jendel, at a 2005 hearing about the benefits of offshore drilling, and now governor, said the oil and gas exploration on the outer, outer continental shelf is vital to Louisiana, and as well as the nation. 
We have seen firsthand the benefits of opening OCS up to safe and efficient exploration and production. Here in Louisiana, we are able to promote and encourage energy production while at the same time also protecting and preserving our environment. I remind people of that quote because now we are talking about a pause, a moratorium, and a whole different look at how we engage with this industry in the future. I think that is, to some extent, a very, very pathetic silver lining out of this whole thing. But nevertheless, it's a step to go forward. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. General A. from all means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I want to identify myself as a proponent of the responsible recovery of our oil and gas resources. And I'm not shying away from that. But I also want to associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Lujan and Mr. Miller and others who have expressed concern about the corporate priorities of BP. Uh, I am of the opinion that there is a corporate culture at BP that prioritizes the wrong things. And I would strongly encourage BP to be introspective about the importance of safety for its workers and of the environment, and they are paramount above all other considerations uh, of your company and should be. And I commend to you our concern that that be addressed. Now, that said, I would like to ask a question. Does BP have a backup plan if the top kill doesn't work? Yes, we, we have ready to go a, a, a low, remember I said we have this lower marine riser package on top. We've been concerned that if we take that right, the kinked riser off, that the situation could get worse. The data we've gotten over the last few days indicates that I believe we'll be able to take that riser top off, and then we've got a containment system built with a rubber grommet seal that we will get on top of that and hopefully capture almost all the oil, if not all of it, while we get other methodologies to try to kill it in place, as well as drill these relief wells. So yes, we do. What do the relief wells hope to accomplish? The relief wells will intersect this well down near the the reservoir itself at 18,000 feet and will directly pump mud effectively at the source of the reservoir and kill it and kill it for good. Okay. Now, if the top kill is successful, what are your immediate plans to proceed with the cleanup? We'll stick with the We'll keep the capacity out there to be able to deal with it if something goes wrong. Let's say the, the, the kill is not sustained, but we think it would be, but we're going to keep capacity out there under unified command to be able to deal with it should it not be. Also, we will continue with the cleanup. We will continue with dealing with the claims and the economic impacts. There's a natural resources damage assessment that's being done at, with NOAA as the lead trustee for the federal government. That will be done and assess the, the damages to natural resources as well as what it would take to restore those as well as pay for the sorry pay for the associated claims uh, around the whole Gulf Coast. Thank you Mr. McKay. I have time remaining and I would like to yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Cassidy. Thank you. Uh, yesterday Jim Birnbaum uh, who was the director of MMS said that they would not have approved a ADP a advanced drill plan I think or permit uh, which would have allowed clearance of the seawater excuse me, replacement of the mud with the seawater prior to putting the upper plug. You know the nomenclature, I don't, so if you'll bear with me. Um, so, and yet that apparently is what happened. Now, she had not specifically reviewed the ADP, but she said that that would not have been allowed. So it sounds as if the, uh, the way this proceeded was at variance with the ADP. Um, so I guess one, is that common that things are done at variance with ADP? Number one. Number two, uh, is the ADP not law? Uh, number three, would both parties have to agree to something that was at variance with the plan that had been permitted by the MMS? I believe that the sequence that was performed, at replacing the mud with the seawater, it, first of all, I don't believe that's an unusual procedure. Secondly, I believe that was consistent with the temporary abandonment 
sundry notice or the application that was approved by the MMS. That's what I believe. That can be checked and we can get back with can you. Can you do that? Because that actually yep. is different than what she said. I believe that's true, but I, I will check that. And speaking to petroleum engineers who tell me they don't do outer, they don't do offshore, but they do say that the more conservative way to do this would be to leave the heavy drilling mud there and then to seal it and then to pull the mud out as opposed to doing it with, as opposed to doing it with seawater in place. Uh, they seem to feel that that was the best. Mr. Newman, your comment on that? Uh, for, first, with respect to the ADP, because we're not a part of the ADP process, when the operator hands us a procedure to carry out a task, we don't have the, uh, the approved ADP against which to compare it. So we wouldn't be in a position to be able to uh, assess whether what we're being asked to do complies or doesn't comply with the, with the operator's ADP. With respect to the procedure for setting the cement plugs, um, that's, that's part of the abandonment plan and would be uh, specified and, and overseen by the operator. Okay, I think I'm out of time again. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, we are voting on the House floor, and before breaking for a vote, the chair first wants to make an announcement, uh, and then uh, we would ask you two uh, gentlemen to be back with us in 45 minutes. Uh, get something to eat or just a cafeteria downstairs, but uh, you can have something to eat there if you like. But uh, this was just announced uh, this morning. The U.S. Uh, Geological Survey Director, Dr. Marsha McNutt, announced this morning that two teams using different scientific methods have now determined that the well that exploded on April 20th has poured between 17 and 39 million gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico thus making this incident the nation's worst oil spill in history and far greater than 11 million gallons spilled by the Exxon Valdez incident. Uh, Chair will uh, announce a recess for 45 minutes while we answer votes on the House floor. The committee will resume its sitting. Which side are we on? Which side are we on? It's, it's Heinrich now. Okay. Yeah, it's Heinrich. John from New Mexico, Mr. Heinrich, right now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. McKay, um, over the last 20 years or so, I think it's fair to say the oil and gas industry has made some incredible technological strides. And, you know, when you think about the fact that, we, that you can start a well a mile beneath the surface of the ocean and literally drill miles into the Earth's crust, um, I don't think anyone can say that's not an incredible feat of human ingenuity. Uh, and I know that employed by the industry, employed by BP are some of the best scientists, geologists, engineers you're going to find in any industry. Unfortunately, I think what we're learning right now is that that kind of ingenuity was devoted mostly to building technologies to allow drilling in tougher and tougher environments, deeper wells, um, more challenging coastal infrastructure, and not devoted to the kind of technologies to deal with these kinds of accidents in those tough environments. Um, as Mr. Miller noted yesterday, uh, we are using some of the same tools to, to address this spill that were used in that 1969 Santa Barbara uh, spill. As I hear from my constituents over and over again, one of the things that folks want to know is, 
why wasn't there a ready to go plan B, plan C, plan D the next day? Um, why did it look like you were winging it days and even weeks into this accident? The, um, the response efforts have concentrated in two, two large uh, pieces, subsea and surface. And the surface spill response plan, which is authorized by the government and sits underneath the National Contingency Plan, that has formed the foundation of the surface response, which I think is, has, has worked overall pretty well, and it's under unified command. On the subsea response, as I said uh, a little bit earlier, th this is a very unique and unprecedented situation. We have this situation where we have a blowout preventer that should have worked, didn't work, and d the ability to manually intervene with ROVs has not proved successful. And we have on top of that a marine riser package which did not release the rig, therefore we can't get on top of that blowout preventer. What we have done is respond in a, and it's the largest subsea response ever mounted anywhere. We've got four deep water rigs uh, operating and drilling relief wells, intervening and containing the oil. So, and 16 submarines that sometimes work. Well, and, and I appreciate the, the quantity of the resources there, but given the fact that a, a deep water blowout like this is certainly a possibility uh, and now a reality, how come you had never tested these technologies, the, the top hat response um, and, and some of these other uh, approaches in that deep water? And, and I believe from your, your own testimony, you note that these proposed strategies to get the well under control have never been tested at this depth before. Shouldn't we be doing some of these things ahead of time so that we know how things are going to respond in these conditions? A couple of things. You're right. This has not not been done in 5,000 feet of water before. The top hat, the the containment domes have been used in shallower water. We are dealing with a rather rather unique fluid here that has hydrate issues, and that is what we ran into. Uh, I would what I what I would say is we are definitely going to learn a lot from this, and I will say uh, uh, that I believe the industry is going to have to look at incremental subsea capability to intervene in situations like this. I do, I do believe that. So uh, we we're, have been pursuing multiple parallel paths on every piece of action that we can think of or other experts, including the government, can think of. We will learn from this and therefore, I think, through regulation and through the industry efforts, we will be able to put in place some more capacity, some more planning, and some more understanding of worst case scenarios that will allow us to have confidence in developing the resource going forward. I do believe that. Can you give me some understanding of the, the thought process that went into attempting this, uh, this what you called a, a top hat uh, containment dome procedure first, as opposed to moving first uh, well? Yes, I can. The, the, top, the top hat was a technology that's been successful in shallow water. It's been used, uh, and it, it was available and ready to go. So we, we knew we may have hydrate problems. We thought that was worth. When you say it was ready to go, you didn't have one staged. We, we did have to build the, it, right? No, we did actually you, have the cover. We, we had to amend it and, uh, okay. and change it a bit to, for, for this, but gotcha. we had it. Secondly, on, on the top kill, we have been concerned from day one that we didn't know where effectively the choke on this well was occurring. Was it in the kinked riser? Was it in the blowout preventer? Was it down hole? Therefore, we've not been able to do a top kill until we were able to diagnose with inside the blowout preventer what was happening to the degree we could. And that's what's, not only did we try to get the blowout preventer closed, we were trying to diagnose and rebuild parts of the blowout preventer. That's why the top kill took as long as it did to get set up. Mr. Chair, how much time do I have left? Or am I out of time? Zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn, is Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that the American people don't like about Congress is that we rush to judgment. And we do this in so many ways. Apart from this whole area, we're doing it with financial reform. Uh, Congress has set up a commission to find out what went wrong in the financial crisis a couple years ago. And we have a report that's due from this commission at the end of the year, but we're doing major financial reform now before even seeing what the results of this commission is that we set up. 
With Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, in the, on the military side, we have a commission, once again, that's going to come out in December, I think it is. But we're acting now as if we already are, know what the results are. We're prejudging that. And in this area, we're doing the same thing. Uh, you've heard today how we, there are bills being proposed to uh, uh, shut off drilling in the uh, Pacific Coast completely. We have legislation in the, both the House and the Senate to create unlimited liability. And we're doing all this for oil spills. We're doing all this not even knowing what the facts are. We can't even wait a few days or a week or two or whatever it's going to take uh, to find out what the facts are before we make our decisions. And, and it's that rush to judgment is, I think, is one of the reasons why Congress has such low approval ratings among the American people. Let's talk about liability in particular. And I didn't know this till just very recently, but apparently under the Oil, Oil Pollution Act, OPA, there are at least, I guess, two types of liability for costs involved with oil spills. Uh, and a, can, can you both or either one of you elaborate on that? Because I guess effectively one type of this liability for cleaning up the spill itself is already unlimited in effect. It, 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 the costs have to be paid, period. So that, that is already unlimited. And the other type of liability is for economic damages or something like that. Can you both elaborate on this? And that's what's said at $75 million? Well, I think that is correct. Um, the the OPA 90 set in forth um, liability structure, effectively, and it, it, it calls for cleanup costs to be borne by responsible parties. It, it has embedded in it a $75 million cap for economic impact claims or damages. Uh, we've been very clear from day one that we're not going to exercise that cap or recognize that cap. We believe we'll sp spend more than that. Um, and also, there is the ability for re reimbursement through the trust fund in some ways, and we're not going to exercise that, and we've been very clear about that. So there are two types of liability for the cost of mitigating the damage from the spill. Is that, is that correct? The, the, the cleanup cost itself, number one, which, is, which has no limits, and number two, the economic damages, which is capped at 75, although in your case you're saying whatever it takes, uh, and that's 75 million. Yes, the the, the open ninety uh, open ninety is a broad. It gives it, it effectively obligates broad responsibilities to responsible parties, roughly in those categories: uh, cleanup costs and economic impact on the environment, as well as the people the, uh, and businesses that are affected. And 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 yes, we have waived or said it's irrelevant the seventy five million dollar cap. Okay, thank you. I want to shift gears here and ask about the uh, blowout preventer. Once we can stop the leak, and that's the number one priority of everyone concerned, then number two, clean up the, the, the oil. But once that's capped, will we be able to bring, it, bring the blowout preventer or preventers to the surface and do a thorough and complete forensic examination to find out mechanically what, what, was the, what the issues were there? Yes, yes, Congressman. Once the well is permanently capped, uh, we will recover the BOP, and we will be able to perform thorough diagnostics and, and a complete uh, evaluation of the BOP to determine uh, what prevented it from effectively shutting off the flow of hydrocarbons. Okay. All right. I want to thank you. If I have any more time, I would yield to another member, but is there any effective time remaining, Mr. Chairman? Ten seconds. Then I'll just uh, yield back. Okay. Unless you can talk. Fast. Gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McKay, uh, are you familiar with uh, Robert uh, Calusa, an employee of your company? I, I do not know Mr. Calusa. Okay. Uh, Donald uh, Vidrine? Uh, no, I don't know him. Okay, so these are the two individuals from BP who uh, were in charge of determining. Uh, whether or not the well was stable uh, and uh, uh, making the call on the withdrawal of the drilling mud. And you haven't uh, 
contacted them in the interim? You haven't been curious as to, uh, you know, what uh, what went on. You, you you haven't you haven't met with them or talked with them. I have I have not. The in, in investigation team, I, I believe, has talked to them. Yes. Okay. Now you said earlier that uh, you were only by press accounts uh, familiar with the, um, you had not discussed nor sought uh, discussion with them. Um, one gentleman has taken the fifth uh, because of the potential for self-incrimination and the other is an undisclosed illness. Has your company informed you of the nature of his undisclosed illness and whether or not it's uh, potentially fatal or whether he will be at some point in the future able to testify under oath as to what happened and, and or have the opportunity to take the fifth like his colleague? I do not know the state of the medical condition. That's mm. evidently been directly with the Marine Board in terms of that uh, discussion, so no, I'm not aware of that. Right, but I, one would, uh, this this is doesn't seem to be a, a good direction. Um, and so then uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, Transocean, uh, do you know uh, the gentleman, uh, Jimmy Harrell? I do know Jimmy Harrell. Okay. And is he a reliable, long-time employee, or? Um, I don't know Mr. Harrell's history with the organization, no. Okay. Um, you probably don't know the uh, chief mechanic who testified yesterday, Doug Brown. I don't know Doug Brown. Okay. So what uh, Mr. Brown uh, quoted uh, or said that uh, there was some heated discussion, and uh, he said that, uh, well, He's quoting uh, Mr. Harrell. Uh, well, I guess what's, that's what we have those pinchers for. Um, so he apparently was not happy with the decision for the whether the well was stable or the withdrawal of the mud. Have you had any conversation with Mr. Harrell regarding that? I have not. Okay. So you're not curious about that. I mean, I, your company has huge potential liability, and you guys are going to be pointing fingers at each other, and you just haven't asked, and no one's asked, and no one's told you. Well, Mr. Brown's testimony before the Marine Board was yesterday, yeah. and so I, that, that was brought to my attention last night. Okay. Uh, it is an issue that our investigation team will be pursuing to the end. Okay. All right, then on to uh, dispersants. Uh, uh, Mr. McKay, I asked you some questions last week, and hopefully you've become a, a bit more familiar with uh, the dispersant uh, your company's using. Uh, during the last week uh, after the hearings, uh, both in uh, resources, I mean, uh, transportation and energy and commerce, uh, EPA asked uh, a BP to uh, reduce use of dispersants and to use less toxic dispersants. Uh, I've read the response letter, and uh, I could only describe it as non-responsive and insulting. Uh, you know, you, you're saying that uh, in that letter, and I, are you familiar with the letter your company sent regarding dispersants? Yes. Okay. Uh, that you purchased uh, 100,000 gallons of CBRAT number four, uh, but you're concerned because of the potential of uh, a, a trace uh, or near trace uh, amount of uh, degradation of something that could uh, create a, a, a non-phenol. Uh, yet, uh, Corexit, uh, is three to five times more toxic on sea life, according to EPA tests, four times more toxic than oil. It's petroleum-based, not water-based. Uh, never been used at these depths before. You talk about a biodegrading, we don't know what it's going to do in the water column or at those depths where there's little sunlight and cold temperatures. Uh, it was used after the Exxon Valdez disaster, linked to human health problems, respiratory, nervous system, liver, kidney, and blood disorders. and. Uh, one of the two Corexit products being used contains a compound that in high doses is associated with headaches, vomiting, and reproductive problems. And we have today press accounts from uh, people hired uh, to do cleanup work who are uh, reporting uh, those, those same symptoms as we had with Exxon Valdez. Uh, so is your company uh, going to honestly uh, and you know, respond to the EPA? The EPA has felt that your uh, response was not uh, adequate. Uh, but uh, they're contemplating whether or not, I guess, to order you to change dispersants. Why are you sticking with Corexit when it's less effective and more toxic? We've been working very closely with the EPA, and as I understand it, the Corexit has been uh, so far the most effective, most available, and least toxic of the of the dispersants. We no, have been no, sir, excuse me. CBRAT number four 
is actually nine times less toxic or Corexit is nine times more toxic in uh, the men, uh, Menidia uh, test and in the Mysodopsis test, which are of some sea, sea life forms, it's five times more toxic than CBRAT number four. And in terms of effectiveness, it's about 10% less effective on South Louisiana crude oil. So it's uh, somewhere between nine and five times more toxic and 10% less effective. And, and there, is, there, there are ingredients in that particular product that, that we have concerns about. We have notified the EPA of those concerns. I think we're, we're both trying to understand whether those are significant or not. We will not do anything, anything the EPA tells us not to do, and we will. And if okay, well, I, I thought they pretty much told you to reduce. We uh, have we have reduced. Okay, and then I thought they told you to look at alternatives, and then you sent the letter back saying, your petroleum-based, more toxic stuff is uh, is preferred. We we are continue. We did commit, and we are continuing to look at every dispersant we can find to see if there is a more effective, available. Uh, and less toxic dispersant. We have committed to that, and we will mm -hmm. do that. Are you familiar with uh, the uh, one, one quick last question on this, Mr. Chairman? Uh, the producer of CBRAT number four just spontaneously called my office uh, and said that, uh, you know, uh, he'd have been happy to sell it to you, but uh, in terms of selling more, he was being asked uh, to uh, reveal proprietary information, and strangely enough, he was being asked to reveal it to Exxon. Now, why, why would that be? I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, well, that's what your company apparently said. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks for holding this series of hearings. Uh, of, uh, I thank the witnesses. Of course, we lament the loss of human life, and we <coughs> lament the damage to people's lives and livelihood and physical and mental health um, and the highest uh, the, the highest need right now is to stop the oil flow, but we do need to look ahead. Um, this is, uh, BP has said uh, it will pay all the costs for the damages, cleanup, uh, uh, economic damages, and so forth. Uh, Transocean, I guess, has filed a limitation of liability, although I understand that doesn't relate to uh, liability under OPA. But the, the question is, uh, how are we going to cover the costs of this and future, uh, future accidents, which surely will occur? Uh, I mean, this has often been called uh, unprecedented, but it should never be called unexpected. Um, this was too, uh, too predictable. Um, oh, about five dozen of my colleagues and I have introduced uh, the Big Oil Bailout Prevention Act, which would raise the liability cap. Uh, would you, each of you, uh, your organizations, uh, your companies, support the lifting of the limit on liability from the laughably small number of $75 million? And if not, would you please explain why you think the limit should not be raised? I can't comment on specific legislation. What I can tell you in this situation, and without our, specific, just should the liability limit be in, raised from the, in, in this, as I said, laughably small, seventy-five million. Dollars. In this particular situation, we are we are ignoring and taking that cap away. So, in our opinion, in this situation, it's not there. Uh, I think it's a public policy question that, that Congress ought to evaluate, and, and I would hope that in that evaluation, Congress would take into into account the commercial considerations and the impacts on some of the smaller operators that, that produce a significant amount of America's oil. So do you want to tell me what those are then? I mean, that's what we need to take into account, yes. I, I don't know what the commercial considerations are. Okay. But I, I, I mean, isn't one of those considerations that a small operation could do a billion dollars worth of damage? Okay, well, um, <laughs> moving on then. Um, <laughs> The, this is acknowledged to be a dangerous employment. Uh, one of you mentioned earlier that you're proud of the ability to manage risk. In other words, this is risky business, or in other words, things can go wrong. And yet, even though it's an industry that is based on the idea that things can go wrong, it is 
astonishing and scandalous uh, to see the lack of preparation, the lack of imagination, the lack of planning for what to do when things go wrong. Uh, didn't know whether top hat or sombrero would still work or whether we should do a junk shot or what kinds of dispersants we should use. Uh, it, it was as if you had never bothered to develop the checklists and methods of action that one might, that, that you should take. And, and an outsider might take that level of certitude as arrogance. Um, I, I think it's obvious that we need to challenge this lack of preparation and ask you to, to explain it. I mean, was it that you were gambling on not being caught or was it that you decided that the risk of things going wrong was really small enough to live with or that MMS never asked you to do these things or that the cost of things going wrong could be covered out of your, what? The, the first response uh, was within hour, just a few hours of the, of the accident. The uh, sub, sub sea response has been the largest ever in the history of the world. It's, we've got four uh, operating rigs, deep water capable rigs, 16 submarines. Um, the creativity has been extraordinary. The professionalism of the employees of BP, the government, the industry has been extraordinary. In the uh, last six weeks, you mean? Uh, yes. But, and but how do you explain the lack of preparation? You've been experimenting this, for these last six weeks because you didn't have in place the checklist, the preparations, the, the tests, the procedures. We had a piece of equipment that, that has failed and it's been unable to be accessed or intervened with by the methods that it's intended to. That has presented a unique configuration uh, at 5,000 feet that we have had to design, fabricate, and build around. I don't think, and I'm not trying to dodge this, I don't think the configuration could have been predicted and therefore fine-fitting mechanical uh, equipment couldn't have been uh, pr uh, predicted. What I will say though, that we are learning that the capability, the subsea intervention capability on a generic basis, a relatively generic basis, must be looked at. It probably has to be improved. It probably has to have an industry uh, uh, sort of structure to it rather than individual companies and I think that's one of the big things we're going to learn out of this. Gentlemen's time has expired. The General Aid from Guam, Ms. Bordaglio. Thank you very much Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. McKay, I have a few technical questions for you. Um, our committee just received the documents that were filed with MMS describing how BP intended to finish the job on this well. On April 16th, BP filed a permit to temporarily abandon the well. The permit indicated that work would start on April 18th, and it would take approximately eight days to complete. Yet everything that has been reported was that the horizon was only a day or two away from leaving the site when it exploded on April 20th. The eight-day job was almost done after only two days. Was BP operating a lot faster than what they implied to MMS? Was it a trying, trying to rush it? I don't believe so. I believe the, the procedure was being followed. And in one of those steps of the procedure, the, you know, the, this well control event occurred, which, which stopped the procedure. Um, that procedure, I think, and obviously the investigations will have to look at this step by step, but I believe the procedure was being followed in the, in the way that it was authorized. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I guess I have a follow-up then. I would also like to show you, um, this is the uh, procedure, eight steps. I have it right here, the document, and um, that BP filed with MMS. It's only one page, eight fairly short steps, and it looks like rather a routine procedure that you probably go through. Uh, regularly. Do you think this effectively conveyed to MMS the complexity of this procedure, which ended during step three with an explosion that killed 11 people? Just looking at it, it seems highly inadequate to describe a very complex procedure. And I do have my permit here, the application uh, that came through, or no, the MMS permit. 
I also have that document stating that it should be eight days to complete this procedure. I, I believe the procedure met all the MMS requirements. I can't put it in a relative sense versus other procedures, but I believe that procedure met the MMS requirements. So you were able to complete something that probably should have taken a little longer in a fairly short time. No, I'm saying that procedure as authorized fit MMS regulations. I, I don't, as to the timing, we never got through the whole procedure. As you stated, the explosion occurred on step, I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but yes. step three or so in that procedure. Was MMS aware of the problems that were occurring with this well? Uh, you submitted a permit that indicated that you had a stuck drill bit. But other than that, according to the documents this committee has, as far as MMS knew, everything was going quite well. Did MMS receive any of the logs that were run in this well, or were they told that there were mud losses, even a major loss event, according to one of your documents? Yes, I, I don't know what MMS knew or, or was told. I don't know. So we have a regulator that is supposed to review and approve your designs and your procedures, but all they have are eight bullet points and few of any indications that this was a troublesome well. It seems like we have a hole in our regulatory oversight, if that is the case. Uh, one more thing, uh, Mr. McKay, uh, there appear to be inconsistencies in BP's permit submissions. Uh, I have that document also in front of me here. On April 15th, BP reported to MMS that the bottom of the next to last piece of pipe was at 17,500 feet. On April 16th, BP submitted the actual well diagram to MMS and it showed that the pipe ending at 17,157 feet. There's a 300 foot difference in these numbers. Can you explain this discrepancy? No, no, I can't. I, I, don't, I, I don't know those numbers to that detail. I don't know. I can't explain the discrepancy without studying it or having someone look at it. We can get back to you on that. Very good. Okay. All right. I do have the documents uh, with me here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yes. I just want to enter into the record, Mr. Chairman, if I might. There's been discussion here about liability, and uh, uh, Ben Ray Lujan raised it uh, on insurance companies. Uh, I just want to enter record uh, the, the story uh, from Reuters that, uh, that all of the uh, actions that Transocean went through to avoid liability for a Louisiana sugarcane farmer for the poisoning of his wells in his, in his fields, uh, where the Delaware judge some 10 days ago uh, cited them and sent them back to, uh, to Louisiana, but they, had, they created false corporations, they created false bankruptcies, false liabilities, all to avoid uh, what they owed uh, Mr. William Tebow uh, in central Louisiana. So I just, again, I think history will help us as we go forward in this hearing and understanding uh, the corporate entity, entities that we're, uh, we're dealing with at a time uh, when they're telling us they're going to take care of uh, all of this liability and make sure these people get paid. I'm just somewhat of a skeptic here. Thank you. Thank, I just I, thank I, the I yield back. for yielding. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that objection, the request or article will be made part of the record. John California, Mr. Costa is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, I have some um, more technical questions as to what took place that day, and then I have some broader questions that I'd like to ask you. Uh, Mr. McKay, two days uh, ago, I understand the committee received briefing from British Petroleum that the uh, status of your own investigation, that British Petroleum reported that there were three clear indications, one as early as 51 minutes before the explosion that this well was flowing, uh, if that had been caught at that time, uh, would there have been enough time to prevent a explosion in your opinion, or were you beyond the point of no return? I, I, this is an opinion, and the investigation will have to, to understand it in more detail than I understand it, but my opinion is that that period of time, there was a well control event, and it could have been caught. Yes, I do believe that. Well, I, I mean, I'm trying to find figure out, and obviously under due diligence we'll get to the bottom of it eventually, I guess, but why it wasn't. I mean, I've been on these rigs before, the chairman and I, about a year and a half ago. It, it's akin to almost being like on a, a space shuttle where the control room is and, and the, sh the dials that are going on in terms of what's flowing in, what's flowing out. 
it, it, it seems to me that they would have been able to clearly see at that time what the indications of the well flow were. Do you not think so? Well, I may get some help by Mr. Newman. It's his rig, but uh, I think there were signs that were happening that um, that the well was. Is that true, Mr. Newman? Uh, Congressman, I, I have reviewed the letter that uh, Chairman Waxman wrote following the briefing and a, uh, a simple strip chart of some data that covers the time period between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. And in trying to tie the three anomalies that Chairman Waxman references in his note to this strip chart, I have a bit of a difficult time because uh, Chairman Waxman talks about something that happened 51 minutes before the explosion. Yeah. But the chairman doesn't well, identify let, let, the time. Let's go the hypothetical then. I, I understand this still has to be looked at. If you're true, if it was true, would your crew at that point, under your operating procedures, have standing orders to shut the well down? They, they would, yes. They would. Uh, Mr. McKay, uh, is it uh, pro forma that you have a British Petroleum uh, officer on the rig at the time? We normally have. Uh, Normally, two to three people on the rig. Uh, it's an overseer, I think. It's, it's we role. call it a well site leader. Well site, well was, site was, leader. Was that person on the well at the time? Yeah, yes. There were two, two other. They do back to back. Yes. Does Does he have access in his office to all the information that the driller would have in those control towers that some of us have actually been on when we've been on site? I don't. I don't know in his office. I don't know. You don't know then. We'll find that out. I said. Okay. What could he have? ordered the well to be shut down, your overseer, your, your, your welder? I think, if it, I think anyone on the rig, were they concerned about a safety event, could have asked Transocean to shut the rig down, including Transocean's And we don't know if he did or did not. I don't know. Okay, I think that's important that we're going to have to find out, Mr. Chairman, as we further pursue this effort. Let me get now out of the weeds and more in the macro sense. The Secretary yesterday talked about reorganizing MMS, Mineral Management Services, and dividing the roles between the collection of royalties and the enforcement procedures. Uh, I know you're trying to focus on shutting down this well, but have you had a chance to get a sense if that would be an improvement? I have not, honestly. Um, I, do, I do think anything that can be taken from this incident, as well as the regulatory uh, structure uh, around this, and, and can be improved is important. I will say that. Mr. Newman, I would think that your focus uh, from MMS's perspective is more in terms of following the regulations and the enforcement procedures. You don't get into the collection of royalties too much, right? That's correct. So would it enhance the ability to increase safety if we had a better cop on the beat that enforced the rules and regulations? Because the relationship we have with MMS only relates to oversight and inspection, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best person to comment on splitting the revenue collection responsibilities from the oversight. Well, no, I, I don't expect you to comment on that, but I'm talking about having a, a person, an MMS person on, on, on a regular basis. I don't know if it needs to be daily or not, but to overseeing this in terms of making sure that all the specs are being followed. MMS visit our rigs regularly. Uh, How regularly? Uh, they're on there about once a month. They, uh, they're, they're out there. They, they come unannounced. Seems like we can still do better. Before the, my time's up, let me ask two of you the, the, the biggest question here, and that is clearly, I mean, we may have different views. I am one who supports offshore oil and gas exploration. Uh, there are those on this committee who don't, but this is a terrible setback. It's a terrible tragedy, and it seems to me um, – how are you, as people who obviously support this effort, going to try to attempt to restore faith that you're capable of doing this on a safe basis? Because certainly the public at this point in time is, has little faith in this ability to continue forward. I think in three major ways. One, stop it, get, get the thing stopped. Number two is clean it up and deal with the economic impacts all along the Gulf Coast. And number three is we must know exactly what happened, the facts, the facts of what happened, such that then we can make changes to move forward and, and regain that confidence. Congressman, I, I can only offer you this the same commitment that I gave to the nine Transocean families when I met with them. We will do everything we can to understand what happened, and then we will do everything we can to make sure it never happens again. Well, we're going to have to do better, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your uh, for the time. and. We'll continue to follow up with the work of the subcommittee next month as we continue to pursue this effort. 
general lady from New Hampshire, Ms. Shea Porter, is recognized. Thank you. Mr. McKay, you said that, that your company will be judged by how you behave now after the accident. And I would say that you're going to be judged by what you did before the accident, what your company did. I sit on the Education and Labor Committee, and I too sat through hearings about the Texas oil refinery disaster, looked at the families with their dead loved ones' pictures in front and the tissue boxes there because of the pain, because BP consistently ignored warnings and indeed fired people who warned. So you're, you've been a bad corporate neighbor, frankly. So you keep saying, I don't know, I don't know, we'll have to have the facts. Well. I've got the Wall Street Journal, and they did a, a pretty good job, I think, of listing the facts. And I just would like to ask you if you agree with them about what happened, what the facts are. It says, BP, for instance, cut short a procedure involving drilling fluid that is designed to detect gas in the well and remove it before it becomes a problem, according to documents belonging to BP and to the drilling's rigs owner and operator, Transocean Limited. Do you agree with that? To cut short a procedure, I don't, I don't cut know. Cut short a procedure involving drilling fluid. Well, I'll be happy to share this article. No, I don't know if that's true or not. I okay. Don't know. BP also skipped a quality test of the cement around the pipe, which we talked about, another buffer against gas, despite what BP now says were signs of problems with the cement job, and despite a warning from cement contractor Halliburton. Isn't that ironic? You agree with that? I, I don't know what test you're talking about in that particular article. Okay, this is cement. If the general lady will yield, it's the cement bond test. Yes. A cement bond log was not run on this well, that's right. Okay, let me continue. In an April 18th report to BP, Halliburton warned that if BP didn't use more centering devices, the well would likely have, and I want to quote from Halliburton, a severe, in big letters, gas flow problem. Still, BP decided to install fewer of the devices than Halliburton recommended, six instead of 21, which we talked about. And they go on to say, despite the well design and the importance of the cement, daily drilling reports show that BP didn't run a critical but time-consuming procedure that might have allowed the company to detect and remove gas buildup in the well. Does that sound I, I don't. I don't know the procedure that that article is referring to. The, the centralizers, there were six centralizers run rather than, I think, six rather than 21. I don't know the logic around why that was done. Okay, and the finally, investigation will be looking at that. Finally, BP also didn't run tests to check on the last of the cement after it was pumped into the well, despite the importance of cement to this well design and despite Halliburton's warning that the cement might not seal properly. Workers from Schlumberger Limited were aboard and available to do such tests, but on the morning of April 20th, about 12 hours before the blowout, they were told their work was done. They caught a helicopter back to shore at 11 a.m. I mean, I just, I can't understand this. I just, and I have to tell you that I believe Americans don't understand how this could be. Did you worry, first of all, that we didn't have the technology to clean up? I mean, we, when we looked now and we looked for plan A, plan B, plan C, it appears that not only didn't you not have a plan that we knew would work, but every step along the way, they ignored. This is, this is from the Wall Street Journal, but you can read it elsewhere. But I want to move on to what CNN is reporting, which is disturbing. And again, I'll just read it, that U.S. and BP accepting few offers of international help, countries say. And they speculate that out of all of the countries that have offered to help, that we've only accepted three. And they're saying one reason BP may not be accepting the offers of assistance is because of cost, some say. Shipping boom from halfway around the world, for example, is expensive. Other factors, according to a senior U.S. official, include liability for any equipment that might be provided and support for any crews that might accompany that equipment. Is this true? Well, I know we, we've gotten 15,000 different ideas and requests that have come in to help. We, we are using every good idea we can find. That's coming through Unified Command. We're using Norwegian scientists for monitoring. We're using Canadian planes for, for overflights and analysis through Unified Command. We've flown boom from Europe. We've flown um, assets from around the world to get in place, all through Unified Command. But have you, has your company turned down offers from other countries? This article says that you have. Turned down? We, we've offers of help, offers of assistance. I, I, I'm, I'm asking you specifically, is, is CNN 
what they just wrote that some people said is because of cost. Is that true? I, I, I don't have any information that say we've turned down offers because of cost, nor do I know if we've turned down offers from countries. I don't know that. Okay, I appreciate it. We've accepted some back. from countries. If you could get back to me on that. Thank you. I yield back. General lady, it's time has expired. General lady from the Virgin Islands, Dr. Christian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I think maybe all the tough questions have been asked, but you know, we're all, as has been said before, deeply saddened by the loss of the employees and the injuries to others, and we extend our sympathy to the company and the families. Um, but in addition to doing all, and this is to you, Mr. McKay, all that you can to ensure that this would never happen again, there are people who are currently working on the cleanup. And I asked this question yesterday, but I want to ask it again. Because <clears throat> in previous bills, the workers have had severe medical problems following up and long after they've worked on the cleanup. And what can you tell me about to sort of reassure us that everything is being done to protect them, to train them well, to protect them while they're responding so that we don't find ourselves years later with um, chronic and disabling ailments in these workers? We, we are training workers. We're getting assistance from OSHA in, in, in training and, and um, uh, several thousand people have been trained. There are instances- Protective gear provided and- Oh yes, absolutely. There, there, there are instances where, you know, working offshore and working around some of this where it's coming up, they're volatile hydrocarbons coming off the sea. So there are people that are, we have had instances where people have gotten uh, um, sick and have been and brought in. And so we're trying, what we are trying to do is make sure that we don't put anybody in that situation. If someone gets in that situation, we get them out and we're training everybody. No one can go touch a touch a, a, an oil or a tar ball or anything in the marsh unless they're trained to operate boom and, and set out boom, pick up boom, skim oil, those kind of things. Everybody's trained. Uh, it's not perfect. I'll be the first to admit, and we're working with OSHA to get it better and better. And you, you, you've answered several questions about your commitment to um, paying for damages and repairs and so forth. That commitment extends to uh, individuals who may be sickened by this, uh, by responding to this bill? Yes, it does. Uh, Open 90 provides for personal injury if it occurs to be um, taken care of, and yes, we will. Okay, thank you. Um, let me ask a gentleman from Transocean a question. I, I, BP has talked a lot about their commitment um, to um, pay whatever is required of them. I'm not clear. Um, I've never heard Transocean say anything to that effect, and maybe I just haven't heard it. Um, but assuming that as the investigation goes forward and we <laughs> uncover what went wrong, if to the extent that Transocean would be responsible, are you making that same commitment? We will satisfy all of our legal obligations. And um, I guess Mr. McKay again. I see a number of representatives from other uh, petroleum companies in the, in the audience here. To what extent, you talked about people from Norway and Can planes from Canada. To what extent have the other oil companies in the United States come to your assistance and um, provided their expertise? And did they just show up and say, here I am to help, or did someone call them in? No, this is, this is an industry effort now, and uh, it's, it's been that way for several weeks. We've had, we have, as an example, in the Houston Crisis Center where we're trying to do the source, where we are doing the source control or stopping the leak, there are 90 companies, 9 zero. Uh, our competitors are working with us, Exxon, Shell, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Petrobras, ENI, uh, from around the world. And we, and we have about 150 people working from the U.S. National Laboratories uh, with us as well, as well as the Navy. Uh, we, ha we have the best scientists in the world working on this. Did, and was the White House or the Unified Command involved in what was their involvement in bringing those companies together? We, we, um, we have accessed the companies and the resources of the U.S. government as well as other countries through a combination of efforts. The companies have offered it. Uh, the Unified Command has helped funnel people towards us. And uh, as an example, 
Department of Energy, Secretary Chu has been uh, very good in getting national laboratory people there. Uh, the, the Navy has offered help. So it's come from everywhere, and the Unified Command has been a way that uh, a funnel to help us to get resources there. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And listen, I want to thank the two uh, witnesses who we have here today in your testimony, but I don't think I can adequately represent to you today the level of anger, frustration, deep concern that the people in western Wisconsin have over this incident. It's one of the reasons why we require a double haul for any transport of oil in the upper Mississippi region to try to avert this. But Mr. McKay, I think you're right. I think both of you guys are being judged today on a number of factors, one of which is how quickly you can plug this gusher. That's all hands on deck. Secondly is how effective and, and, and uh, uh, quickly you can mitigate the disaster that's being done and working with the state and local communities to clean up the damage that is occurring and that will continue to, to occur. And finally, this is where I part company with, with, with what you think needs. You gotta be completely honest and transparent and open with the American people right now. And I have to be honest, sitting here for a better part of today, I am less than impressed with your testimony today. This head in the sand type of testimony, not knowing, not talking to people, not giving us information about what happened and why, just isn't cutting it. It's not cutting it back home. You know, it's frustrating that we have to be picking up most of the information today over printed press or the media, as far as uh, the facts. I mean, just, just this week, Coast Guard Mineral Management had the hearing down there in uh, Kenner, Louisiana. Doug Brown, chief mechanic for Deepwater, Deepwater Horizon, testified that he witnessed a skirmish on the rig between British Petroleum, well site leader, and crew members employed by Transocean, the rig's owner, the morning of the blast. Mr. Brown said the disagreement followed BP's decision to replace heavy drilling fluid with light, lighter salt water before the well was sealed with a final cement plug. Well, this is how it's going to be, a BP official is quoted as saying, according to Mr. Brown. Now, Mr. McKay, is it your testimony that you haven't, you haven't talked to Doug Brown at all about this or anyone else that was there participating in this argument that occurred on the rig the morning of the blast? First of all, our investigation team is trying to talk to everyone they, they can. They've talked to our employees, as I understand it. They've not talked to any Transocean. You're the head of the company in North America. Have you had any conversations with anyone who was present with first-hand knowledge of what that argument was about on, uh, on that rig before the blast occurred? No, I have not. We, we are doing an internal, independent investigation, and I have been 100% focused to the extent I can on the crisis. I just find it curious with your lack of curiosity about what happened on that rig and what was said and what transpired. Mr. Newman, is, is Mr. Brown your employee? Yes, Mr. Brown. Have you had any conversation with Mr. Brown about what happened on the rig that morning? I have not. Well, I tell you, gentlemen, I think your companies are hanging by a threat if you're hoping to continue to do business on any offshore drilling in the United States territory with the response and, and what has happened here. It is extremely frustrating. Then you got Andrew Gowers, BP spokesperson, declined to answer any questions about workers' accusations or about whether costs may have factored into the company's decision to use the casing system it chose for the Deepwater Horizon. This is the response that we're getting, you know, from BP about what happened. And I think as the facts leak out, the narrative becomes clearer and clearer. I think BP went cheap on the casings that was used. I think they were under considerable time and financial pressure to move this along. And because of it, they bypassed basic safety uh, procedures and testing procedures that could have averted this. And the main reason this happened is because you're being charged $533,000 a day to rent the Deepwater Horizon rig. And you were already 43 days behind going to a different place and beginning a new drill operation at a cost of $21 million and counting. And so the pressure was mounting. And this is the narrative that's coming out right now. And I know there's investigations that still need to be conducted, but it would be more helpful if the representatives of the companies were more forthright and candid about what happened so we know how best to respond to any future. And there could be another one waiting tomorrow uh, or next week uh, that we don't know about. And we could be taking steps right now in order to avert it. Mr. McKay, let me ask you another question. Again, it appeared in the media as to why BP let workers from Schlumberger, a drilling services contractor, leave the morning of the accident without conducting a special test on the quality of the cement work that's done. You know, engineers describe these tents, called the cement bond logs, as an important tool for ensuring cement integrity. Why did that happen? I don't know why the decision happened to not run the cement bond log, but that decision was made. 
uh, if I could say, the, the the data that you're quoting and working from is is exactly what we shared, including with this committee two days ago. We have we have not finished our investigation. We have pledged to be transparent, and we have brought to this committee as well as others everything we know as of this date. Everything we know. Well, as a former special prosecutor, I find your testimony less than credible. It may work for the attorneys representing your companies right now, but it is not flying with the American people. And finally, just one question as we do look forward. You say you got two relief wells being drilled right now. If there had been a relief well already in place before this disaster had occurred, would that have mitigated or prevented this gusher from occurring? If at the time you drill the original well, you also simultaneously dry, uh, drilled a relief well at the same time, uh, in case an accident like this occurred, would that have prevented what's taking place today? That would require drilling duplicate wells for every well. Exactly. And, and, and if you did that, would this avoid the disaster that we are witnessing in the Gulf today? Presumably, you would poise the relief well above the reservoir. I don't, I don't know. I Does mean, Canada require that of all deep water drilling? in their territory, a mandatory relief well, mandatory relief simultane well, simultaneous. simultaneous. I don't know. I don't know. I've not heard that. I don't know. Well, it may be something we have to follow up with as far as what additional you know, safeguards need to be put in place. Mr. Chairman, I see my time's expired. I thank you for your indulgence. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me follow up very, very briefly on um, some questions that Ms. Shea Porter and Mr. Kind were asking about this cement. Um, uh, Schlumberger, Berger, as you heard from Mr. Kine, was sent away about 11 hours before the test. Um, and Mr. McKay, do you know why they were asked not to perform the test, or not asked to perform the test? Yes, yeah, so I, I don't. I don't know. Normally, I'll give you generic. This I don't know specific to Wait, this. You don't. You don't know in in this situation though. Do you know who sent Schlumberger away? Do you know who was in charge of making that decision to tell them not to do the test? Uh, I don't know specifically. I would imagine the well site leader was probably the well site leader. Is there an investigation currently going on into this particular issue? There, there are multiple investigations going on about the whole sequence of events. Okay, and is cement, part of cement. that investigation on why this test was not, the cement bond log test was not performed? I think, yes, I think all the chronology of the steps and decisions that were made. Okay, yes. do you know what the status of that investigation on the cement bond log is? Um, that discrete step, no. I mean, it's okay. part of the investigation. And and are you concerned that Schlumberger was asked not to perform that test in this situation? Does that concern you? My, ex I'm drawing on my past experience, not on this well. You you normally run cement bond laws. There are inferences of cement bond. You normally do a positive test to make sure the cement bond. Uh, you look it's at the way holding, the, right. the yeah. job was pumped. Yeah. And and potentially a positive test then and and decisions are made whether to run the bond log or not in this particular situation i don't know why that decision does was it made concern you that it wasn't made i think it's it's in, it is it's, it's, it's not a hard question does it concern you that they didn't do it in this case the whole operation concerns me the whole operation including the failure to do the cement the bond. cement operation what happened pumping uh, it, it uh, yes uh, thank you um, i want to ask you another question which is is um, uh, Mr. Probert, who was in our committee before, testified when he was at the Senate about the cement bond log test, that the only test that can really determine the actual effectiveness of the bond between the cement sheets, the formation, and the casing itself is the cement bond log test. And um, usually, and I think this is what you were just talking about, um, a cement bond log test is performed if earlier tests indicate potential problems with the cement. So my question is, do we know at this point whether the pressure tests of the cement job that were performed before the blowout indicated potential problems that would require this test to be done? What I, what I know is that the cement job was pumped effectively and the volumes matched and it looked like an effective cement job. So there were no indications in advance as far as you know? Through the pumping of the job. Okay. Then there was a positive test that was done that looked like it held. Then there are these anomalous tests that were done on the negative tests. When this, I don't, I don't personally know when the cement bond log was released, you know, 
released off yeah. the platform versus the sequence of events. Okay. Uh, let me go to another issue, and that's the blowout preventer. Um, according to the Washington Post this last Sunday, BP agreed in 2004 to have um, Transocean replace a variable bore ram with a test ram on the blowout preventer. Now, a test ram cannot actually stop the flow of oil and is therefore useless in an emergency situation. The letter from Transocean stated that by BP signature, it acknowledged that replacement would, quote, reduce the built-in redundancy of the blowout preventer, thereby potentially increasing BP's risk profile, end quote. Mr. McKay, why was a test ram installed in the blowout preventer if it would reduce the redundancy and increase the risk of a blowout? Do you know? I'm not familiar with the decisions made at that time to get a test so ram installed. You don't know. Now, it's, it's since come out that BP wasted valuable time. We talked about this in the Energy and Commerce hearing after the accident, trying to activate the test ram, test ram thinking it was a variable bore ram, and they lost nearly 24 hours trying to activate that test ram. And you had testified before that that was because the port that was to be activated by a remotely operated vehicle was connected to the lowermost ram cavity, the one occupied by the useless test ram. So my question is, how much time would it have taken after installation of the test ram to change the connections in the emergency port so it would work? Well, perhaps that's for Mr. Newman. Does Mr. Newman, do you know the answer to that question? Because these connections from the ROV intervention port to the actual operating cylinder on the BOP are hoses, they're hose connections, it would be a simple matter of changing it the routing of that hose. It wouldn't have taken any time at all, correct? Simple matter of changing the routing of the hose. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. General Lady's time has expired. General Lady from California, Ms. Caps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. McKay, yesterday your colleague, John Watson, who is the CEO of Chevron, uh, was uh, addressing his shareholder meeting in Houston. And he made the statement in that context that he believed that the federal government should raise the safety standards for offshore drilling in order to avoid another tragedy like your massive oil spill. Do you agree with Mr. Watson that the federal government should raise safety standards for offshore operators and that these standards should uh, be required, in, in other words, be mandated standards? I do believe uh, lessons from this incident will change regulations and there will be standards that are raised. And you I believe, do believe they that, should be? I, do, I believe they should be, yes. Um, so now, thank you, so now um, uh, BP is supportive of proposed MMS rules to require additional safety and environmental management systems because in September, uh, BP um, opposed the, the, the proposed rule. At that time, you said in a letter to MMS that the proposed rule was too expensive and too uh, prescriptive and too extensive. And it's my understanding that you had worked out a deal with MMS in the past uh, that uh, voluntary standards be created by the industry uh, and that these be based on best, best practices. So um, what, is, what is it that changed your mind? It is the spill? That particular letter addresses some uh, a request for input from the MMS where we, we did say we didn't favor more prescriptive regulation. We favored uh, reg uh, regulation that would hold all companies to very high standards and in that letter later in the letter we recommended where we thought that could be improved so we were it was it was about the prescriptiveness prescriptiveness of it versus more regulation so which part of it you don't agree with the, the methodology that they were pursuing we suggested a different way in that letter okay but you you wanted to you wanted to have control over how the standards would be. This, this requirement, this request, and the public's asking for this, is that the government set these standards now and that they be m m more strict, more prescriptive, more extensive than in the past. Let me just say, we are absolutely aligned. Anything that will make this safer and this incident not able to happen again, we are supportive of. Okay, I want to turn to a topic that's been raised, but I'm also very concerned about the people who are working now uh, to clean up this spill. They are in close contact with the chemicals that are known to be hazardous to human health. 
Yesterday, the LA Times reported that fishermen hired by BP, uh, while, and they described the training class that they were in, they were only told not to pick up oil-related waste, and they weren't provided with protective equipment. This fisherman who gave the report wore leather boots and regular clothes on his boat, and when he asked what BP told them, this re fisherman responded, they, the, the BP officials, told us that if we ran into oil, it wasn't supposed to bother us. Now, Mr. McKay, the Unified Command has recalled the vessels operating in Breton Sound after crew members reported health problems. Do you agree with the Unified Command's decision? Every, unified, we're working with Unified Command as part of Unified Command as a participant, so absolutely the Unified Command system is the structure and we operate on. do you agree with their decision to call these workers back? I don't know the details, but yes, I mean, we, we, are, we are absolutely in agreement with what Unified Command's doing. I still remain so struck by BP's lack of preparedness for this bill, and now uh, lack of preparedness for the cleanup. May I ask you, Mr. B Mr. McKay, what were BP's annual profits in 2009? I I'm sorry, I don't know the exact number. I, I think 16 billion, I'm not sure. They, and, I can get that to you. And this is profits? Yes, and, and worldwide. Your, and your salary for 2009? My salary for 2009, 650,000. And, and plus a bonus? Yes. What was your bonus, sir? Uh, about 1.1 million. Okay. So this industry with 16 billion in profits and pretty high salaries for its management cannot properly outfit workers and volunteers who are cleaning up the mess. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Capps. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomer. Um, Mr. McKay, uh, we were told by Director Birnbaum uh, yesterday that there was a mitigation plan for such an accident as this uh, that had been approved by MMS. Could you tell us what the first three steps were of that mitigation plan, if there was one? The first, I don't know the first three steps. These, these. Uh, so you. If there was a plan, there, you obviously didn't use that plan we have in mitigating the, this issue. We have used the oil, oil spill response plan. It has been the foundation for the entire surface response. It was... But then the, what would have been the purpose of even having a mitigation plan for such an emergency if that's not what was immediately gone to after there was a blowout? It was, it was immediately actioned, literally immediately actioned, about three hours after the... The mitigation plan? Yes. Okay. Yes. Then tell me what were the first three steps of the mitigation plan? I don't have it in front of me to tell you the first three steps. What I know... Well, what was the first step? A first step was the Mar Marine Spill Response Corporation was called to start staging and deploying resources, and that happened within just a few hours. Coast Guard was notified and helped search and rescue. Resource uh, crisis center was stood up immediately, which is part of that plan, uh, in Houston. Uh, three days later, I think three days later, in Robert, Louisiana, Unified Command was. All of that followed the the spill response plan. Organization phone numbers deployed resources across the whole Gulf Coast that were activated, and that all happened exactly by the plan. And I okay. think that, Alan... Well, how can you say it happened exactly by the plan if you don't know what the plan was? Because Commandant Allen has talked about it and said that the plan was enacted as, as authorized. Okay, and was this BP's plan or was this the Coast Guard plan? BP's plan. Okay, so Coast Guard got a copy, but you're not familiar with it. I'm, I'm relatively familiar with it. I don't know each step in terms of which one's one, which one's two, which one's three. Okay. Well, where can we get a copy of that we mitigation can, we, plan that was approved? We can provide that to the committee. All right. Uh, um, and I'd ask the chair uh, if we could have that uh, without objection then. The plan, the mitigation plan provided to the committee. Without objection, so ordered. Um, and... We have, um, we've also heard that um, uh, in order to assure that proper um, blowout preventers uh, were properly inspected and tested, that offshore 
inspectors from MMS would come and observe testing. Uh, Ms. Birnbaum was not able to let us know whether or not there was an offshore inspector from MMS that was present for a test within 14 days of the blowout. Uh, do you know whether there was an offshore inspector from MMS in the 14 days prior to the blowout who observed a test of the blowout preventers? The, the last MMS visit to the, to the Deepwater Horizon occurred on April 1st. Okay, so that would have been outside the 14 days, obviously. Um, now, does, uh, does Transocean or BP um, have any say in who will come out and be the offshore inspectors from MMS, or does MMS, uh, entire, are they entirely responsible for assigning those inspectors? Uh, that's an MMS decision. They, they just show up on the rigs. You don't have any say in who comes? No, sir. Okay. So um, are you aware of uh, the last team of two inspectors that came to inspect the uh, offshore um, activity? I do not know the names. Deepwater Horizon. I do not know the names. Of the are you aware they were father and son? Um, I do not know the names. I, I don't know anything about you, the individuals. Were you aware that they were father and son? Don't know anything about the individuals. Okay. So... I'm still asking, did you know they were father and son? Uh, if you tell me they are, I'll know it, but I don't know it. No. Okay. The answer is no, then. Thank you. Uh, and obviously, you didn't request them. Did BP request those individuals to be the ones to come out and test? No, not that I know Observe. of. Observe. Okay. Uh, now, we've heard that the administration has had and continues to have a boot on the throat of British Petroleum. And I know that's hyperbole, and I know that it's been said many times, but could uh, you, and my time's running out, if you just tell us what that means, how has this administration kept the boot on the throat uh, as they attended charity events and basketball and all that? How did they keep the boot on your throat? What have they done? Well, we've, we've let me just say, we're, nobody's more frustrated than we are and want to get this thing um, killed and, and cleaned no, up. I understand that. It's the, costing you a lot of money, and you've said you're going to take care of all of we, the damages, correct? Correct. Okay, so how, how has the administration kept the boot on your throat? There, there, there have been many reviews of what's going on uh, with Secretary Salazar, Secretary Chu, uh, many visits to Robert, Louisiana, as well as Houston, all right. uh, in, in reviewing exactly what's happening. Most of those came more than 10 days after the, uh, the blowout, though, correct? I don't remember when the first meeting was. It most of the visits. Most been, of the visits, yes. 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 Okay. And so uh, there have been these um, visits and whatnot, but have there been any threats, any intimidation at all from the administration? No, we're, we're under extreme pressure to get this done. By our own, uh, by our own needs as well as the administration's. By virtue there. of the damages you're looking at for right. one thing. Gentlemen's, uh, gentlemen's okay. about a minute and a half over. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Um, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes is recognized. Come over here so I can see you better. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just had a really one set of questions. It shouldn't take all the five minutes even. Um, all of the statements we've been hearing in describing this uh, situation and, and what happened, the tragedy of it, talk about how unpredictable this was, how unprecedented it was, um, describe how hard it is to clean this up or fix it or address it when you're 5,000 feet um, under the under the ocean, uh, because it's not like having it right there on land or easily accessed, correct? Yes, it adds to the difficulty. Yes. And so that, to me, that that begs the question of if it's so hard to clean up something or or address something that goes wrong at those levels, if it's as unprecedented a, an, a, an environment in which to operate as has been described, 
uh, it raises a question of why, why we're there uh, in the first place or the kind of analysis you have to do up front about whether to go to a place where if something goes wrong, your ability to fix it is severely compromised or limited. Um, and so what I'm curious about is if there was a law that said oil companies, for example, have to demonstrate their capability to respond to a leak at the site, to clean that situation quickly and in an effective way in order to be able to go do the drilling and that let's say your capability to respond would be certified by MMS or some other federal agency. Uh, would you support that kind of thing? I mean, it seems like a reasonable standard to put in place. I, I, do, I do support coming out of this incident and what we learned from it that subsea intervention capability, as one example, is an important thing that needs to be looked at. And I think there's uh, both the company's ability to do that, and I quite frankly think there'll be an industry-wide need for certain capability that needs to be demonstrated um, in the future. So in general agreement. Do you have a comment? Uh, <clears throat> I would support what Mr. Mr. McKay has said. I think coming out of this, there, there needs to be a reevaluation of the preparation for oil spill mitigation. Would, would you agree that that some kind of certification re regarding by, by some independent authority as to the companies demonstrating that it has the wherewithal to address a leak situation before a permit is issued would be a reasonable position to take? I think it's something to consider, it, it, and I think my personal opinion is there'll need to be a, a sort of a, a company look as well as what access to industry capability, formal or informal, could be gained to give confidence around intervention capability. Okay, thanks. Thank you. A gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and as I said it, uh, uh, to each of you, um, about a week ago at the Transportation Committee, I'm uh, like everyone else, I wanna make sure that we do everything possible to uh, get this mess cleaned up and, and find out uh, uh, the cause. But uh, I do have this concern that uh, I hope that uh, uh, we don't go to such extremes uh, in overreacting uh, uh, to this that we basically uh, uh, cause a shutdown of uh, much of the offshore oil production in this country because if we do, uh, that would potentially drive up the price of gasoline and who it would hurt in the end, it would hurt millions of poor and lower income and working people in this country and I don't want to see that uh, happen. But Mr. McKay, uh, you, uh, uh, you told me um, the other day and I was trying to remember that there had been 90, it was it 92,000 oil wells had been drilled in the Gulf over the last 50 years or so, or what? Do you remember the figures? It's it's 42,000 total 42, wells drilled offshore in the U.S. 42,000. Yeah. And and 7,800 platforms or some kind of the over 7,000 production platforms or injection platforms in in offshore U.S. in the last 50 years, about 2,300 deep water wells drilled in the last 24 years? The, uh, uh, I guess night before last, Campbell Brown said on her program that uh, she used the words that so far this had been bureau bureaucracy at its worst. And then I saw Governor Jindal on CNN last night uh, saying that uh, he hadn't been able to get uh, the emergency um, permits that uh, he's wanted. Uh, what, uh, what's not going on that uh, should be going on can either one of you tell me that, what he was talking about? He's, he indicated that the state is being held back uh, because of bureaucratic delays and so forth. I think, I think, I'm not sure, I think that's in reference to barrier islands uh, to be built um, where they require permits, uh, environmental assessments, and, and effectively whether, whether they would be effective for this spill response. And I think that's, what's, I think that's what he's talking about. Uh, 
Uh, now, last week at the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee hearing, you may remember that, uh, that I commended BP because uh, I said that the company seemed to have done more in advance than any uh, other company I'd ever heard of uh, in response to um, uh, various accidents or tragedies. Uh, but, um, uh, but last week, uh, uh, you, you said that uh, you'd paid 19,000 claims, and today you said you'd paid 13,500, and I'm curious as to what the, what the uh, discrepancy is there. I, I did say that, and I corrected it later in the hearing. There were 19,000 claims that had been made, and I said paid. There had been at that time about, I, I can't remember, about 6,000 paid, and I did correct that at the hearing. Oh, okay. Today there have been about, uh, and I'll get the number wrong, but something on the order of 25, 26,000 claims made and about 13,000 plus paid. And as far as I know, that th those are accurate of as of yesterday. Now, I know that you have, uh, you've been concentrating most of, uh, of your efforts on trying to cap this well, and I just was told by an aide that they think there may be some success in this latest work. I don't know what the, I've, I've been in other meetings, so I don't know what the report was, but uh, what, uh, uh, what is doing uh, uh, about the cleanup on where the oil has already come up uh, uh, to the surface? I th people, people are really concerned about this. Obviously, we're trying to fight it offshore and keep it offshore, and there, but there are areas uh, in Louisiana in the marshes that have been effective, affected. Uh, the cleanup in some of those areas is to get wa basically water hoses and wash it back out and then boom it or skim it up. Some of the marshes that are very sensitive, it's, it's unfortunately better sometimes to just leave it and let nature take its course. But there are various cleanup techniques that have been authorized for different priority and types of marshes and those are being enacted. A lot of it is trying to hose it back out of the marsh. Obviously keeping it from the marsh is priority one and that's what we're trying to do. Once it's there, once it's there, it's pretty sensitive and we have to be careful with the cleanup operations. I know that people have been talking about all kinds of uh, weird or unusual uh, uh, methods of uh, reacting to this and I th I, you know, I've heard about golf balls and mud and all kinds of things being put down and then but uh, one, I had a constituent who told me that there was a demonstration on one of the networks about uh, uh, dumping uh, hay into the water and then recollecting the hay. And they said, they said they did this demonstration showing that the hay absorbed the oil and cleaned up the water very quickly. Have you he heard of anything like that? I have heard of it. There, there are a lot of natural materials that will soak up oil. A lot of them soak up more water than they do oil, and, it, and it's actually a fairly big problem to pick it up. A lot of the technology that's being used today, the sorbent boom, is is a much, much better at picking up oil than, than hay or other natural substances. That's what's being used to try to soak it up. And, and, and so I think this is through unified command. I think we're using the best technology available uh, in, in trying to soak up the oil and keep it off the shore. Gentlemen's right, time. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Gentlewoman from California, Ms. Napolitano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to enter the record two uh, um, articles that uh, have been given to the, to the chair uh, in regard to uh, the emotional and uh, health uh, impact to uh, residents of other oil spills, especially the Ixan Valdez. And it refers to the estimated uh, uh, 250,000 birds, 2,800 sea otters, harbor seals, bald eagles, killer whales uh, that died along with billions of salmon and herring eggs. Um, it says, British uh, 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 Potomac takes the heat for allegedly downplaying the initial threat to spill in Gulf of Mexico. Um, I'm, I'm really, really uh, perturbed um, in going into this uh, issue of health and mental health services. Um, apparently it alleges that, because uh, I don't have the, the, re the uh, actual report, that uh, community exhibited a kind of social stress you can imagine. Alcoholism went up, suicides went up, family violence went up, divorces went up, and of course bankruptcies and various kinds of financial failures went up in the attendant stress of families. Um, and then of course they felt burned by the U.S. Supreme Court who slashed the jury award. So I'm, I, I keep hearing uh, legitimate uh, claims. And while they may end up in court trying to figure out whether they're legitimate or not, I hope this does not happen in this particular case as long as they are 
uh, connected. Um, and uh, to that effect, I, I, I would ask if uh, you have set up any kind of, of uh, system to be able to help not only the families of those deceased uh, uh, workers, but also those uh, families that have been impacted, whether it is the, uh, um, the fisher uh, uh, boats, the fishing boats, the, uh, all of those along the coast, and, and the business, the tourist business, all of those that are going to be suffering because people don't want to go and smell this gasoline smell. Sorry. Yes, we have. I, I, we've got uh, 28 claims offices across the Gulf Coast. Those have been set up to deal exactly with the things you're talking about. And under Open 90, the Coast Guard has a lot of experience through, uh, p through Valdez and post Valdez that they have exercised. Just very quickly, I know you want to go, we've got f sort of three systems working. One, our claims office and claim centers that are working with 400 adjusters yeah, across the Yeah, you talk about the claims. I'm talking about services to those men and women and their families uh, in regard to their stress. So that they, and this is aside from the, uh, grief, the filing of claims, this is a services to them to be able to recuperate and not have the divorces or the suicides or any of the PTSD that is uh, mentioned in some of these articles. We do have community outreach centers, but uh, w what I need to do is get back to you on our plans for sustainability going forward to address those type of needs. Well, I would hope so because uh, I would hate to see this seemingly drive a greed overtake BP, uh, the moral responsibility to those that is, has harmed through their uh, uh, negligence. Uh, I'd also want to um, uh, ask, um, let's see, the, uh, the emergency response plan that you would be working kind of dovetails in some of the questions that have been asked before. Um, was there a plan A, a plan B, a plan C for those wells that are anywhere between 3,500 and 5,000 feet? Because apparently there's very little you can do at that depth. What plans were there? What could be carried out, had they been tried out, had they been tested, to be able to determine whether or not you'd be able to handle a spill, whether it was nat natural uh, or whether it was uh, by mistake, whatever. The, st the structure in the, in the past and up to present has been the spill response plans have been effectively concentrated on surface response. Uh, through this incident, we're, we're learning, obviously, uh, that there are conditions in subsea and 5,000 feet of water that are very difficult, maybe more difficult than people would have thought. There are, there are response plans that are predicated and partly dependent on that blowout preventer. And if not being able to actuate when the event happens, at least being able to intervene with an ROV and be able to shut it, or at least being able to access it. And how, that has not how occurred. Many, I'm sorry, but my time is running out. How many wells do you have that are uh, over 3,500 feet? I don't know. Roughly. Over, give me a rough estimate. Well, I know there's 2,300 drilled in the Gulf of Mexico over 1,000 feet. So it would be a pure guess over 3,500 feet. Over 3,500. And uh, any of those using the same kind of material or the same kind of structure that you use for this 5,000? When, when they're drilled, they use similar blowout preventers and rigs as has been used here. Now, apparently the blowout uh, um, uh, safeguards that you had, how many were there? About five, I, I heard, in one of the prior hearings? There are various, various uh, barriers to, to, to blowouts, from mud to semen encasing to well control to blowout preventers. Okay, and in those instances of those other wells, are you utilizing the, sa utilizing the same uh, methodology as you used on this one? Similar methodologies are being used. We have, we have recommended and are implementing incremental and enhanced testing of blowout preventers, which we're doing. Uh, I believe that redundancy in blowout preventers and other systems will need to be looked at. Uh, we're looking at subsea intervention capability and what should be planned or available. I'd uh, like to know if, if you'd submit a report to the subcommittee to find out how many wells are actually possibly in danger that might cause a similar a blowout uh, that would cause a greater damage. Mr. Chair? Yeah, the, uh, that has to be the gentlewoman's last question, though, because you're they're, they're a minute over. But if the... Um, I've waited. No, I understand. If uh, Mr. McKay would like to submit that in writing, we would appreciate it. We will. And the last question, is there any uh, anticipated participative training for your personnel on this three to 5,000 feet level to be able to understand what can, cannot be done and to develop the plans that hopefully will cap some of these uh, 
uh, outbreaks or blowouts. There, there absolutely is a lot of training and there will be more training going forward, yes. Would you please submit something of that, uh, of any of those responses to the subcommittee so we know that hopefully uh, we will not be looking at this in the future? Okay. So you could follow up in your uh, in written response. Uh, the gentlewoman had two articles that she referenced. Yes, I gave them to you. Okay. I gave you copies. I passed them down. If not, I'll get you an additional coffee, sir. All right, without objection, um, the gentleman would like those submitted to the record without objection, so ordered. Um, I think I'm next, right? Okay, I'll recognize myself then for five minutes. Um, gentlemen, I, um, I have to say that um, uh, long before President Obama announced that he was going to uh, expand um, offshore oil drilling uh, for oil, I guess, and natural gas. Um, you know, a few weeks before the BP uh, disaster occurred, he made that announcement. And I have said before, I was very disappointed in that because I don't believe we should expand offshore drilling uh, beyond the leases that have already been approved um, ever, frankly, because uh, I think that uh, the technology doesn't exist to uh, prevent a spill in the deep water, or once the spill occurs, uh, to stop it. And uh, I know a lot of testimony has been taken about, you know, what it could have been done to prevent it, what is being done to stop it. Uh, frankly, I think um, nothing you could have done would have prevented it, and nothing that you will do uh, was able to stop it quickly. Hopefully you'll have the ability to stop it soon. But it all points back to the fact that over the years, I've just heard over and over from all the oil companies, not just BP, others, oh, we've got plenty of ways to prevent spills, we've got plenty of ways to stop a spill once it occurs. And I think this oil spill in Louisiana shows very um, dramatically that none of those things are true. We may have believed that they were true, and maybe mineral management believed they were true. I never believed they were true. Uh, spills occur all the time and spills will continue to occur. Um, so I guess my question is, why should I believe um, that, um, that if we, that we're not gonna have another deep water spill again and that you'll be able to do anything about it in the future? I mean, I, I assume that you could tell me if you don't, do you, do you continue to advocate that we should expand deep water drilling? In other words, would you agree with the president that we should expand the lease sales and go into new areas like the Atlantic with this type of deep water drilling? Would you agree with that? Do you agree with the president? I, I do believe that this industry uh, can operate safely. I believe that the learnings from this will change the way deep water is done in some ways in terms of regulation, in terms of safety systems. So you would agree with the president that we should continue to have expand deep water drilling in the Atlantic and other areas where it's not done now? I believe, I believe after we learn what's done here and, and has happened and those learnings are incorporated, I believe that resources can be developed safely in an environmentally sensitive way. Well, why should I believe you now? Um, you've been, you, you and other big oil companies were saying all along, telling the president, telling minerals management that uh, this was safe and we could do it. It didn't, it wasn't safe. You weren't able to control it. You're still not able to control it. I hope you are in the next few days. Why should we believe you? Why should we believe that the technology is out there or that it will be developed? Doesn't this, doesn't this spill show very dramatically that statements made by you and others were simply not true? I mean, you may have thought they were true, but why should we believe that they are? I'm not, I'm not giving you bad intent. I, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is I'm not saying you were lying. I'm saying you believed certain things that have proved to be false. Why should we believe that uh, you can make a difference in the future and that we should expand things? Well, let, me, let me tell you what I believe. I, we, have, we have a context of 42,000 wells drilled offshore that has had a, a good safety record. We have an incident that I think is unique and unprecedented that we must learn exactly what happened. And I believe that we can put in changes in our operating practices industry operating practices and regulations that will allow resources to be developed safely. I why didn't it work this time? Why did, why, what went, you know, in other words, why should, you know, all these assurance that, assurances that were made didn't prove to be true? So why should we act on that and instead just let's have a moratorium? The president announced a halt today to drilling 
uh, operations at, at all 33 deep water rigs in the Gulf of Mexico for six months or until a presidential commission completes its work. I commend him for that, but uh, it seems to me, based on what happened, we should just have the moratorium in perpetuity. I mean, we had that for many years. Uh, in fact, until the last couple of months of the Bush administration, there was an executive order in place for 20 years. There was an in interior appropriations uh, rider in place for as long as I've been in Congress, over 22 years, it said no expansion. That was lifted because you made assurances, not you personally maybe, but the big oil, made assurances that we didn't have to worry, a spill would occur and we'd be able to control it. But it, this proves the otherwise. I, I, I just don't understand. There's no reason to think that we should expand. And you're just telling me I should trust you. And I mean, I know you're an honest person. I'm suggesting otherwise. But you don't give us any reason to believe that we should have those assurances. Unless you want to give me some. That's the end of my question. Give me an insurance why things are going to be different. I don't hear it. As I've said, I, I think we've got a track record for 50 years that's been good. And I think we will learn from this in an unprecedented event to make it safer going forward. That's what I believe. Well, I think it's just, you know, I can't. I have to have something more than just your belief. But I, I do appreciate your, your effort to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen is recognized. Um, Mr. Newman, you had mentioned earlier that you would accept, even recommend a hiatus, if you will, in drilling till we sort out what's going on. But I don't think a lot of my colleagues understand there's a difference between deep water, ultra deep, and just offshore. Uh, and it's my understanding that the access to the blowout preventer, if it's just offshore as opposed to ultra deep, it's much more accessible. And that the difficulty here is that it's basically ultra deep. So when you say there should be perhaps a hiatus, do you mean for all offshore or do you mean for ultra deep or just deep or you see where I'm going with that? Yeah, I think there are differences in the level of complexity with respect to offshore drilling. And uh, operations in shallow water environments where the um, the, the BOP is basically at the rig, it's on the surface, it's easily accessible, um, probably presents a lower level of challenge and complexity with respect to operations going forward from this point. So I see no reason to, to call a halt to shallow water operations on jackups where the BOP is readily accessible. And I'm, I'm not sure whether the President's uh, moratorium applies to all offshore. He's very concerned about the tourist industry in Florida. I sure hope he's concerned about the roustabouts who are working in Louisiana uh, in a jackup. I just learned that word from you, if I'm using it correctly. And so we have to recognize there's a lot of working folks who are employed in this industry, and it's, it's been an uh, industry which has provided folks who otherwise have fewer options, good livings with good benefits. So uh, I hope that's not lost by the President as he addresses this issue. Uh, going back to um, the stuff that you all submitted, Mr. McKay, on page 27, uh, it talks about the pressure holds negative test and said the drill pipe pressure it measured at Halliburton stayed steady at 1400 PSI, et cetera, no flow observed in the kill line. And the rig team was satisfied that the test was successful. The rig team, would that include all people on board, uh, Halliburton, BP and Transocean. I'm just just trying to understand this this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, well, I'm not I'm not sure who who was involved in 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 the discussions and acceptance of the test. It would generally be a collaborative discussion of uh, and involve various people, including BP, Halliburton, Transocean. Okay, so it would have been more than one person, though, huh? So it would have been a, it would have been a agreement among everybody. Well, the investigation will have to see how it actually worked, but generally those types of decisions are discussed and the consensus is arrived at. Okay, next, and you may not be able to answer this, either one of you. Um, I had a National Research Council thing which suggested that MMS, NOAA, and others, this is back in 2003, form a committee to understand all these things, the use of dispersants, the use of the fate of oil in deep water situations, et cetera. 
And, um, and I'm struck that our government agencies back in 2003 apparently didn't act upon it. I say that because at least part of these recommendations are part of their recommendations for what we should do now. I'm thinking, well, why didn't we do it in 2003? As far as you know, was industry ever called by MMS, Coast Guard, et cetera, to do a, um, a plan on how to address potential complications of deep and ultra-deep drilling? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. So this would not have been solely an industry responsibility, it would have also been a, 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 a governmental responsibility as well, fair statement? No, you can't answer that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna postulate that yes, that would be the case. Um, the president is apparently going to recommend that 33 wells currently being explored uh, be activity be put on halt. What thoughts do the two of you have about those 33 wells currently being explored, activity being ceased? Any thoughts, either one of you? Well, I believe, I believe as I, I said a bit earlier, that I think we need to learn from this incident. I think that'll be relatively quick because there are some incremental changes that I think can be made now. And uh, then after that is incorporated, then I think uh, it'll be up to the government to decide whether to move forward or not. Last thing, and, and Mr. Last thing, um, I, I don't know the answer to this. I'm, again, asking just to learn. Uh, there's a lot of questions as to whether or not the drill pipe was centered at the bottom of the string, I gather. Um, and uh, Transocean put, uh, submitted documents to Energy and Commerce Committee that showed the effects of a drill pipe being off-centered versus centered and the ability of the cement to seal around that drill pipe at the, at the shoe, I guess, if I'm getting my words correct. Um, how do you confirm that the drill pipe is centered at the bottom of the well? That, that, that graph you all submitted to ENC, how do you confirm that it is centered as opposed to off-centered, therefore we can trust that the cement is most likely operational? Yeah, I think you're talking about casing rather than drill pipe. Okay, and, thank and, you. and the only way really to manage the centralization of the casing in the outer string of casing is to put centralizer on, on it. That's the primary function those centralizers serve. And is there any way to know that centralizers are working correctly? Did we know that six were better as adequate as 21? Because I think it said here that that was, that was not best practices. This is in the Wall Street Journal. Um, that while some were not consistent with industry's best practices, they were within acceptable industry standards. Um, um, so it is acceptable. So presumably there's some evidence that six is adequate. Is that a fair statement? I think this will be part of the investigation, but I but I understand the six were there to the, and covered the reservoir section and centralized the pipe. And I don't, as I said earlier, I don't know the decision making between six and twenty one, and the reasons for that. That'll be part of the investigation. So it'll be an empirical discussion as to whether or not the six is adequate, because you'll see whether or not there's leaking or the acoustic test or whatever. There's no way to visualize that. No, know. there's no way to check that in, in, a, in a visual way. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman's time expired. Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Mr. McKay, today the U.S. Geological Survey flow rate technical team issued its findings that its best initial estimate is that the well is leaking 12,000 to 19,000 barrels per day. That is two to nearly four times what BP had been claiming for weeks. Earlier this week, your company provided me with an internal document dated April 27, 2010, and cited as BP Confidential that shows a low estimate, a best guess, and a high estimate of the amount of oil that was leaking. According to this BP document, the company's low estimate of the leak on April 27 was 1,063 barrels per day. Its best guess was 5,758 barrels per day, its high estimate was 14,266 barrels per day. Were you personally aware on April 27th that the number BP was citing in the press of 1,000 barrels per day was your company's low end estimate and that the leak could be as high as 14,000 barrels per day? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not personally aware of that at the time. I, I, the 1,000 barrel a day was a unified command estimate at the time. That, so that was not an, an estimate that was based upon BP's uh, information that they gave to the Unified Command? It, it may have been based on uh, information from a variety of sources, and I'm sure BP had input into it, yes. Well, you were in command of all of the information for that first week. You were the only source of information in that first week. It was your rig, it was your, um, your um, um, 
uh, submarines. It was you who had that capacity to make a determination. So you're saying you did not know that it was 1,000 to 14,000? I personally did not know. You did not know? No. It seems hard to believe, honestly, Mr. McKay. You're the head of BP America. You're B BP's top official here in the United States. Um, you say that you're unaware that such documents uh, exist, uh, but your company had these estimates. Uh, shouldn't they have sounded the alarm if other people in your company knew that the range was 1,000 to 14,000 barrels? Should other people in your company not have sounded the alarm that it could be a vastly greater catastrophe which was unfolding? I, I, don't, I don't know at that point in time what was shared with who, but I believe that all of our data and estimates were being shared within Unified Command with NOAA. And as I understand it, NOAA contributed information from overflight and from dispersion estimates in the water. Well, these are your own internal documents, Mr. McKay. They say that you knew that it could be upwards of 14,000 barrels per day in the first week, even as BP was saying it was 1,000 barrels per day. So I think BP had a responsibility to the American people to let everyone know that it could be 14,000 barrels per day right from the very beginning, because that would have changed a lot of the response that, in fact, occurred. Could I get, just comment on that? Um, Admiral Allen has been clear that whether it was 1, 5, 10, or 15, it would not have changed the response. I disagree I, with that. I, I, think that uh, I think the amount of dispersants which is put into the water is uh, very much tied to uh, the amount of oil which is in the water. Uh, I think there are the number of booms which you need uh, for the coastline are tied to how much oil is in the water. Uh, how far this plume can go uh, is is based upon how much oil there is in the water. So I don't agree with that assessment that BP has made on this issue, okay? It's not, it's not in fact, accurate. Many things are contingent upon, upon knowing how big this catastrophe is. Does BP have a financial interest, Mr. McKay, in underestimating the size of the leak? If I could you repeat the question? Does BP have a financial interest in underestimating the size? In of the underestimating the size? Uh, I, d I don't know. I don't know. Well, the upper estimate of the, uh, you don't know if you have a stake in, in underestimating? We, we, we certainly have. We, we're going to clean up everything that happens. So the, 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 the size of the leak is, uh, the absolute value of the leak will not impact the response we have, the claims that we pay. We've said, we've said from the outset that we're responsible for the oil spill response, cleanup costs, reimbursement to the government, claims that result from it in terms but of- But isn't it true, Mr. McKay, that the higher the rate of oil that went into the ocean is the higher the liability uh, for BP? In other words, under the existing law, if it's only 5,000 barrels per day, um, then the liability under the existing law for BP is $185 million. If it's 19,000 barrels per day, uh, which is the estimate that came out today, the liability for your company is $2.1 billion uh, for this spill. There's a big difference there uh, in liability. And what I'm afraid of, Mr. McKay, is that BP was more concerned about its liability than it was about the livability of the Gulf uh, by lowballing uh, the number of barrels of oil per day uh, that was being sent out into the Gulf. That's my belief. Our, our position is to do everything we possibly can to stop this, provide as much data as we can, as fast as we can, clean it up and deal with all the economic claims, and presumably the, the amount of oil f will, will result in uh, whatever impacts the shore has and the, and the uh, cleanup costs, as well as the government's response and our response. So, um, Well, if you had not maintained this fallacy that it was only 1,000 to 5,000 barrels per day all the way uh, until the last couple of days, uh, there would have been a substantially different reaction. Could I just comment, those were unified command. 
based 1, on BP figures. No, based and no, and NOAA figures. I have a NOAA document that I can give to the committee about 5,000 barrels a day, calculated two two different ways by NOAA, and it was a unified command decision. But again, reliant upon your own data and your experts. On Will the gentleman yield? I'll be glad to yield. Uh, I've, I've participated in the 3 p.m. joint command call between MMS, Coast Guard, NOAA, and others. BP's not on. And I've continually asked for a uh, rate of flow. And I have continually been told by MMS, NOAA, Coast Guard it's very difficult and that they were doing their best. Uh, that's also been a point of frustration for mine, but in fairness to BP, um, I've heard it straight from the agency's mouths that they have been unable to do it. So I yield back. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, again, dependence upon um, a BP uh, figures, uh, I think, is central to the, any evaluation that any agency is making. And let me ask you this, uh, uh, Mr. Newman. Uh, BP, to its credit, has agreed. I wrote a letter last week to each of you asking you to make contributions to an independent science uh, consortium that could be put together. And BP has made a commitment of $500 million to that independent science consortium. Are you willing, as a corporation, Mr. Newman, to make a contribution to uh, a um, consortium that, of, of independent scientists who can make analysis of what is going on down there and what should be done in the long term in order to protect and preserve the Gulf from the worst consequences of this catastrophe? Yeah, I'm unfamiliar with the letter, Congressman, but I'll certainly take it into consideration. I'm, I'm not familiar with what the Science Foundation is intending to accomplish, but I'll, I'll, I'll review it. Well, it, it's intended to have the best science available for the people who live in the Gulf going forward, not just BP and not just Transocean, but to have the best scientists we have in our country uh, be funded in a way that all the best decisions can be made going forward to protect the people down there. And I hope that Transocean makes a substantial contribution uh, as well. Um, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the, at the end of the day, it may be, it's BP spill, it, but it's America's ocean. It's the people in the Gulf's ocean. We have to make sure that they get protected. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will be as brief as I can. Um, I, I'm going to keep harping on the, some of the information. Um, the uh, hearing before the Department of Interior, uh, I had uh, asked um, whether they had adequate environmental baseline information to be able to assess the damages that are occurring to the wetlands, the marshes, the islands, and the near shore areas. And the answer, of course, at that point was not very encouraging. And I, I, I associate my remarks with my colleague, Mr. Markey, because of the amount of oil that is going into some of these areas. Um, and I ask the question because I know that without some of these hard numbers, these quantitative, quantitative numbers, um, your company can argue uh, every assessment that is made. And there's a history, with, again, with Exxon Valdez, uh, showing a clear path of what is likely to happen, um, you, you'll question every expenditure uh, that is claimed and try to get the courts to limit the exposure and the cost, uh, whether it's the five or 11,000 uh, um, um, that Mr. Markey was, was referring to. My question uh, is, are you willing to commit that BP will assume the long-term commitment, certainly to exceed 20 years to continue to support scientists local fishermen, businesses, mental health needs, social needs, and the full recovery costs for the environment that have resulted from this black death? And I would like a yes or no answer. Could I at least the, the- Yes or no, sir. I can't put an end on it. I can't put a date on it. What I would, what I would say is under OPA, we are going to fund the natural resource damage assessment, which will set the baseline as well as the restoration plan. So in other words, there is a baseline and there will be a cap on some of these things? No, 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 no. No, there's a baseline to establish where we started from. This is by the government, not by us, but this is by NOAA, that establishes what the resources were, were there before any damage, establishes the damage, then establishes restoration and recompense from that point forward, uh, okay. or as long as it is needed. And as I pointed out, uh, the article that I submitted for the record indicates that in uh, the Exxon, Val Exxon Valdez, uh, that uh, there's still litigation pending um, because of whatever, uh, or actually the court, the court damages were reduced 
for whatever reason, of some of these individuals that had suffered uh, these uh, injuries. Under OPA 90, which happened after the Valdez, this was put in place such that a, the government agency would do the assessment, the restoration requirements, meaning costs and schedule for however many years it takes, would be set. And then we have said, as a, respons a responsible party, we are going to step up to those obligations. Well, I, I'm hoping to be around. Um, the other question I have is, uh, or actually a statement and a question, uh, President Obama has already admonished uh, both of your companies for finger pointing, and it certainly seems there's still a lot of the blame the other guy going on. Uh, BP's investigators seem to, not surprisingly, be finding that it was Transocean's fault, or Halliburton's fault, or the fluid company's fault, et cetera. Uh, more disturbed to find out the companies are withholding information from each other. Mr. McKay, your investigators said that they were not getting access to Transocean employees. Mr. Newman, you have said your company is not getting access to BP data. Can you both commit to stop playing the blame games and get working to find out what went wrong? Let me just say, we want to understand what happened. We want to cooperate with everyone. It doesn't answer the question, sir. And we are sharing documents and working out, I hope, an ability to, to talk to Transocean employees. We're sharing our documents. Uh, but not getting to talk to each other's employees. That's being worked out, I believe. And to what extent? Will there be a solution, or is this just not going to be? I hope so. I hope so. Well, Mr. Chair, I hope they can find a solution because I think this is part of where we're going to find uh, um, some of the solutions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're done with this panel. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McKay and Mr. Newman, for your patience and responses today. We appreciate it and all you're doing to try to resolve this disaster. Survivors of the Deepwater Horizon oil rig explosion appeared this morning before investigators in Louisiana. The Coast Guard and the Minerals Management Service are conducting the joint investigation.